Our time is now 8.30. We will call the meeting to order. Stand please for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right. I uh, just want to make one note of an item that's been pulled for anybody that might have an old copy of the agenda uh, under item 8, Braden CRA District, the Arts Center Manatee Project Finance Agreement. Uh, we've pulled that at the request of the uh, applicant. Right. Uh, we will now have citizen comments for items not on the agenda. Uh, the only person I have right now is Jennifer Hoffman. Hi, everybody. Um, I if, your, if you could please give your name and uh, yeah. who you're with. Jennifer Hoffman with Keep Manatee Beautiful. Um, I am coming to give you a little briefing on the things that I've done since September when we decided to go into contract with each other. And so um, I have some very big news to share with you. We are finally doing our underwater cleanup. We are gonna be cleaning Manatee River, both the bridges and the railroad track bridge will be cleaned by 50 divers. We will have four locations on land as well as 10 different boats and about 15 kayaks in the water taking trash from underneath. Both mayors and several people who are historians I have asked, no one can tell us that it's ever been done before. So, um, we have a lot of police and sheriff um, that will be out there for whatever we bring up. Um, I've been assured there's no bodies, so we're okay there. Um, but it should be very interesting. It's gonna be a lot of fun to see what comes up. I mean, the one that we knew had been cleaned up recently still had full toilets and a motorcycle and all kinds of things. So ones that we have no idea what's under is going to be a blast. There's going to be um, historians along the river on both sides telling um, stories of the history of Manatee and the river and the Bradens and all of that. So it should be a lot of fun for anybody who stops and watches as well. So I invite all of you out. It's um, May 19th, which is a Friday. And I'll send this information to you guys um, separately. Um, but I also wanted to talk about um, the different cleanups that we have going on. Um, May 6th is our first Saturday cleanup, and that's going to meet right here in front of the um, City Hall and clean up Riverwalk on this side. We are going to be here again um, doing Village of the Arts is our August 5th cleanup. And then again in um, October, we are doing Neal Park all the way up to 17th Street or Avenue Park, straight up the canal and cleaning both sides of the canal in the neighborhoods. 17th Street Park, thank you. Yep. Yeah. And so um, then we are going to follow that in November with a Red Barn Flea Market cleanup which anyone who drives by there knows that that is a blighted area. And so we're going to be cleaning not only 301, but along the railroad tracks as well. Okay. And so I'm done, so we'll yeah. forget it. Uh, if, <laughs> but if you could please, oh, like you said, email sorry. all that to us. Uh, yes. We can certainly distribute it to the public as well. We absolutely will. So I am so happy to be with you guys. You got the double horn there, so right. <laughs> you really have to sit down now. Okay. Um, that was the only non-agenda citizen comment. So we'll move on to consent agenda. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve. Oh, I wanted to pull something. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Then speak up. <laughs> I'd like to pull item D, the finalist agreement for Mineral Springs. Okay. All right, then I will move to approve item uh, consent agenda A, 4A, B, and C. 
Okay. Is the motion on the table? I'll second it. And then a second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of approving item consent agenda items A through C. Aye. 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 Okay. Passes. Uh, discussion on item D. Item D. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to pull this because of the discussion about the, I wanted to, I felt like we needed to have a discussion about the budget. Okay. Because um, the way, I, I just feel um, that it was going up to 350000 and I, in my opinion, I want to, I want to, I feel like we need some public art in other spots than just at Mineral Springs. And uh, so I, I thought maybe we should, have the board give some kind of direction as far as their thoughts on how do we spend all 350 in mineral springs when it's, it's a little truncated at this point and i feel like some of the public won't be down there so i i hate to for us to put all our all of our public art down there i mean i just felt like we needed to have that discussion about the budget and what what our intent was because i know they're going into um, the final phases on the piece. So, when I saw 350, I, it gave me a little bit of um, pause. Okay. I agree that it was. I also noted that it was a it was a lot. And when we had our one on one, we talked a little bit about total budget, but we're about to be in that budget process. So, I wasn't sure where you know, do we have this discussion? You know, now as far as art is has has it already sailed? That was what I, I wasn't totally clear on. I think the project originally <coughs> had 200. Am I correct? So what? So when the project was budgeted about three or so years ago, um, in the budget it's for 200,000 for one art piece. So when the public art advisory board started meeting and discussing the project, they weren't sure if they wanted to do one piece, if they wanted to do multiple pieces. So then, in order, and they also didn't want. Um, to put it too low so that we would get quality artists to submit proposals to the RFQ. So the thought process was um, we're going to give them, you know, a potential. This is not a done deal. This will definitely come before you for your uh, guidance and final decision. But it was if somebody wanted to do three pieces and if the public art advisory board loved all three pieces and they presented it to you and you loved all these three pieces, then at least it was in the RFP and it was publicized. However, you know, whenever the public art advisory board is going to make their recommendations at the end of March, we'll bring those recommendations back to you. And at that point, it's whatever you all let us know. So we can stick to the 200. And if that's ultimately maybe where you want to go even without hearing the presentations, we'll, whatever feedback you give us today, we will pass it on to the public art on May 23rd. Um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so they're presenting, and and then we'll have some discretion to talk about it then. So procedurally, would we not vote on this yet until after. Correct. Right now we're I not. We wanted to have the discussion. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. This this budget was advertised on the RFQ, so we have to at least keep it in that range for now. But when it comes back to you for negotiation and everything, it can totally change. We can we can go as low as 90, 97, or we, we could go as high as 350, whatever your discretion is as a board. I guess at one point, and not being an artist myself, at what point have we obligated ourselves to pay for art if the artist thinks that this is the range and we, and they've created something that presumably costs them money as well? Do we have any? I and I, maybe that's a question for. Dean G, would you like to come speak, please? So right now we're at the finalist stage. So what they're doing right now is they're preparing their. Um, final concepts. So none of the concepts have been approved or even seen yet. Right. And um, I do want to let you know we had four finalists and one dropped out. So we have three now. So um, anyway, those budgets mm -hmm. um, that we gave them were arranged. And so during this concept phase, they're supposed to give us what they think it will cost for them to make their art. And, and if I can clarify what 
our obligations are as CRA at this point. The purpose of this agreement is to provide for the funding of the stipend and the travel expenses. So we'll get something back. So this is we're only committed to that piece. Okay. And I hope you do approve that today so that I can get that out to the um, finalists because it gives them the dates, you know, it gives them more information than just the general that I've given them. Yes. I think my purpose, and, and I have no, I mean, I want to approve this. I just, we don't have a great way to communicate with the Public Art Board. And so um, I want them, I know right now they're kind of focusing all on this one project, but I want them to re to kind of pull back a little bit and say, wow, there's a lot of pieces on the original part of the Riverwalk that are either in disrepair or gone. And so I hate to put all our money in that basket, especially at this point when that part of the Riverwalk is not even as engaged as the other. And then we have that next final phase that's coming that I think you and I've discussed has a place that I feel I would like to see some public art. So um, I just want to make sure the public art board can kind of pull back and not just say, okay, we got 350, let's all spend it at, at Mineral Springs or in that phase of the park. That's my opinion. And I don't have any other way to get that to the public art board, so. If that's the kind of the consensus of the board, we'd be happy at the next meeting. And the chair, actually, of the Public Art Advisory Board, uh, Ms. Aristizabal, is here. So she, I think, if I'm hearing you, that, you know, of course, there's no final decisions, but as you would like to caution them that your preferences of now would be not to go to that maximum amount and to think about, in the future, potential other areas for art. Well, not having seen any of the submittals, it's hard to be that definitive because if there's something that's just a huge kinetic piece that's fabulous yeah. and will get national attention well and that's a different story but yeah none okay. of us know at the moment okay. we've got you know it was just a request for qualifications first mm -hmm. so this is when they truly give us and if you'll remember we did give them three broad ideas which you know obviously we want to talk about the history and then the singing river right by the river and we have a wonderful lure in our city so there's those two and then we mentioned nature but it was mostly about um you know making sure the nature is integrated you know because it's such beautiful nature there mm -hmm. so um and of course okay. it's in my ward so i want to have it be amazing um it's but I agree, that, and we want it. I know, I know, and that's yeah. the thing is that. But to her point, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a good, valid point. I do. I think when we did that, when with funding was allocated, that we were looking at, you know, what was already allocated with a little bit more, just in case. Is that right? So, um, that's where we are. So. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a, a motion to approve item. D for um, am I in the wrong? no D for approval of the finalist agreement for Mineral Springs Park at Riverview East Public Art Project. Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Let's start the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Passes. Um. I'm sorry, sir. What did you say? Agenda yes, sir. Yes, that's what these people have signed up to do. Okay. I believe the forms are in the back. Okay. Sure. Well, everything's passed. Yeah, fill out a form. But it's all passed. I am Bill Sanders, uh, 2502 Riverside Drive East. Where you start, sir. I'm You're expertly familiar with this process. If you wanted to fill out the form, 
you know there's they're back there please in the future yeah, i didn't know that. in the future please sir don't play us for fools you know the process thank you I, i'm sorry appreciate it all right okay i want to get three minutes yes, sir um on the consent agenda you have a couple large projects that <clears throat> was approved on October 12th of 2022 while I was out of town to a CRA convention in Daytona and <clears throat> I wasn't the minutes weren't available so I have now read them and <clears throat> this project was mentioned as early as July 15th of 2022 but i was not able to get any information on it because under state statute i was informed by the director that there was an agreement between uh, the cra and the uh, uh, client to not disclose any information on it so i heard um, mr perry kind of violated that agreement and let the cat out of the bag and said it was about three million dollars two to three million I, I saw different numbers so i was never able to discuss it i wasn't at the meeting and it, it got passed but oh, here's the here's the problem i have with it is that in reading the minutes that are now available there was a conflict of interest i'm not i'm not uh, opposed to the project the project seems like it's a very good project uh so that's not my issue but the issue is that that we have counsel here that has a dual uh, <coughs> representation, one for the client and one for the city in a contractual matter. And it was, it's in the minutes that there is a conflict. I didn't write the minutes. You raise, if you, would you like for me to read them or, or are you familiar with them? You, you, have, you have, you represent the client and you also represent the city and now we have a, a two hundred thousand dollar proposal before the city that you're on both sides of the uh, contractual negotiation. I think before this is approved, I would ask the council to consult conflict, consult this with a conflict attorney that has no um, uh, skin in the game, as might be said, before. Uh, this is approved. Otherwise, what's the rules of, of uh, do I just always, if I want a project, go to Mr. Redisell and say, well, you represent me because you represent both sides. It doesn't seem to not, me not be very fair. So I'm asking that the city council, before they vote on this, on a consent agenda, to review it with a uh, conflict attorney to make sure that uh, both sides are represented fairly. Thank you for your comments. Okay. There was a, another item that, that you have on the art board, and you, I, I, did I understand you pulled that? Yes, sir. Okay. Presentation on this 2021-2022 CRA annual report, please. Mr. Chairman, if uh, I could, yes. just before we move on. I, okay. Our firm had nothing. We had no role in the in either of those grant applications just I, I think the board's aware but I want to make sure that yeah, it's I'm on the record thank you this is Marvin, Jeff. I, I just felt that that I was going to ask mr. reader still to address it because in my conversation with with him and with the CRA director at there was no involvement with this correct thank you Mr. Sanders, you are fully aware of the rules of order here. Please do not address the board from the audience. You had your moment to speak, your three minutes to speak, as everyone else does. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. CRA board, CRA attorney. Um, I wanted to, my name is Katerina Jaragio siren and I'm the CRA Executive Director, and I have the distinct pleasure to be in front of you representing my wonderful team um, and bringing forward to you our annual report for fiscal year 2021-2022. Um, 
According to the Florida state statutes, every CRA by March 31st has to complete an annual report and uh, present it to uh, the board. And we're also gonna we're gonna be putting it on the website and also informing our county counterparts of that. So we're gonna meet, meet all of our uh, legal requirements. But the legal requirement for this report is could be just bullet points of some projects that we've done. But we don't do things that way. We don't just do bullet points. We, we go all the way. So I'm um, proud to present that we have over 40 pages of projects and initiatives. Um, we have a very long agenda. So yesterday, my team and I were discussing on how to best give you um, a presentation on this. So you will be getting a nice um, materials next week once they're back from the printer. Uh, but today, we're just going to go very quickly over some of the initiatives. And I'm very glad to see that we have a full house today. And um, I am so thrilled to have citizens come to our meetings. I encourage them to keep coming and volunteer with our events and all the activities we're promoting. So um, we're starting the report in the beginning to kind of, for those that are not familiar with the CRA's districts, giving kind of a little bit of a background over each district. We were introducing our team, the CRA board, and not only do we have our, uh, our internal CRA team, but we're blessed to have two advisory boards, uh, soon to be three. And I know Ms. Aristizabal is here. Do we have another, anybody else from our advisory boards? Robin? Uh, Ms. Singer, but so I want to say thank you to all of them for volunteering their time because their feedback is truly very helpful and they know we take it seriously and I know you all take it seriously. We have several grant programs, so we go forward and we discuss these programs, um, what in, you know, a summary of them but then we also go through each one of them in detail. So we had four grants in the Bradenton CRA. We had Teresa's Restaurant, Oscura, uh, Mr. King's Property in the Downtown, and Cafe Streetside Cafe. In the Central CRA District, we had uh, Mr. and Mrs. Posthuma, who did a, an amazing job um, building up. It was It's a co-ed space with work and residents, and they really put a lot of love and time and money and effort in it. And we also, um, you also approved a grant for Tijia in the 14th Street uh, CRA District. We then go toward, we go on and we talk about the public arts. So actually yesterday was the one year anniversary since they, uh, they had their first meeting. That's that picture from the first meeting. And when you read the report, it's amazing that they, their first project came to them on that first meeting. And they started talking about the RFQ on the second meeting. So it was not, a, you know, we didn't give them time to take a breather. We just put them to work immediately. We also discuss, talk about our community policing. As you know, the CRA um, is sup supports um, right now three community policing officers along with uh, the, the sergeant. And this partnership has been here for years and they're just a wonderful team. Anytime there is anything going on, first of all, they have the beat of each CRA district, but they're also so responsive. You know, the other day, one citizen called us about a problem in in the village, immediately called Officer Pulos. He immediately responded, sent us what we needed. So this is a daily collaboration with an open line of communication. Ms. Siren? Yes. Would you mind putting that back? Because I think there's a significant reading down here. It says, using the funding of this program, the team has helped 17 homeless individuals reconnect with family and find housing. Absolutely. If our mission is to eliminate slum and blight and to try to lift up neighborhoods, that is one of the best ways to do it. Absolutely. 
that you read also in the back. I mean, some of the activities, being part of the events, um, they are helping with the development review committee, um, and so they're septed certified. They get special training for their duties. So truly, in my opinion, they're the best of the best. Code enforcement also is very critical as we're trying to lift these CRA districts out of the slum and blight conditions. So um, code enforcement worked in conjunction with uh, the police department and they focused on three areas that they have listed out there. Um, this year we're actually taking um, a bigger focus on code enforcement but with a kind approach and you'll hear a little bit more after. Um, so you'll be seeing, uh, now that we've upgraded our grants, we gave more funding so that people that, you know, may want to upgrade their windows can replace the doors but may not have all the funding, the CRAs can, is here and they can help them. So we're going to get the word out and hopefully we're going to get inundated with a lot of requests uh, for repairs, both for residential as well as for businesses. We're also highlighting our largest um, uh, partner, Realize Bradenton. We have, they're a wonderful organization and we have so many activities that we, we go through, we, we, they help us with. So to highlight some from last year, uh, Walk Bradenton um, is, is the app that, they, that we use in order to promote walk, walk, walkability as well as the businesses um, within the districts. A lot of social media, I mean, there's so, they have so many followers. So once, if we want to get the word out, they're a great opportunity for us. And they've always, every time we've asked them to promote an event and do anything, they've done it. As you know, they also put together the Bradenton Public Market. Um, and we were uh, sponsors of that last year. Um, it's 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 35 weeks and approximately each week they count <coughs> over 2,000 people that come to downtown Bradenton. Not only do the local businesses, all uh, Main Street merchants benefit from it, but all the vendors that are there, are. It's, it's just a great tool for us to advertise all the achievements, all our beautiful downtown, as well as promote economic development and redevelopment. And as you know, we also sponsored the cookies and the event, the Valentine celebration last year. Um, they also did a Love This City events. Um, so I encourage everybody that hasn't gone to absolutely take some time and go. Um, some of the events that they also put together, um, we, we were sponsors for the Bradenton Blues Festival um, that took place in December 3rd and 4th, 2021 at Lecom Park and the music in the park. This year, um, last year, our report was done by district. So this year we decided to kind of do it by category. So you'll see we have categories like projects and events um, instead of just focusing under districts. So in the 14, uh, we had several projects in the 14th Street CRA district. Um, we have a, an incentive for Grand Palm Apartments, which is a senior housing on Tamiami Trail. Um, we also uh, sponsor the, an economic impact study to see if some, if some properties that we have uh, along Tamiami Trail would be a good location for the potential relocation of City Hall. The study came out this fiscal year, but we began the process uh, in 21-22. Um, also highlighting is the Met. Um, so the Met is approximately 200 units of workforce housing, um, also along the Tamiami Trail. Um, it will be a 15-year agreement that they require to have workforce housing at that location. In November of 21, there was a groundbreaking ceremony, and I want to say it's probably one of the best that I have been. It was so warm and you had residents and business owners from the village walking and coming and participating and taking pictures. So as you can see, 
these are, this is what was the construction that took place uh, back then. But during this year, you've seen it gone up. And my understanding is that they'll be complete by this summer. So looking forward to <coughs> a celebration of the opening of that. Um, I think, in my opinion, two of the lar biggest impact projects that we did is purchase land in the Village of the Arts. So there were five properties um, in the heart of the village, the former green properties, that we, that you all approved to purchase. And that was truly the definition of slum and blight. The activity that was there was bringing the area down. So once we purchased them, we, the community came out, thanked all of you for making that commitment because it was a substantial commitment financially for us to take, but it was the right thing to do. And now we're in the process of getting surveys, getting feedback so we can decide what we're gonna do with this property. We also acquired 1444 14th Street West. So as you know, we own the two adjacent lots um, on the north side, and um, it made sense to purchase that last vacant lot to do a bigger assembly, and now we have uh, the full frontage along Tamiami Trail. <coughs> Astoria on the 9th. Um, it will be coming, it, will, it started uh, last fiscal year, but the majority of it will be this year and next year. But it, this is another affordable housing unit, 120 units, <laughs> that is uh, in the 14th Street CRA, approximately two acres. And you know, they came before us and truthfully with all the costs, this project would not have happened without the county and the city and the CRA stepping in. In the Bradenton CRA, um, we just attended the groundbreaking for review, review, review six. So the CRA board uh, approved to give uh, a forgivable loan to HTG. Um, the city of Bradenton also agreed to waive the impact fees. Um, they came before you all approximately two to three times because initially you had approved it and within a period of four or five months when they went out to bid, the, the prices of everything, materials, cost had gone up so much that truly, again, this is a project that would not have happened without you all stepping up and, and bringing it forward. We continue to support additional uh, affordable and workforce housing through 920 Manatee. Um, it will be 137 units. It's in the Bradenton CRA. And um, there was a groundbreaking ceremony. Um, and again, September 9th of 2022. So it falls in the last fiscal year. So it every time I drive by, it keeps going up more and more. and. I think it's a challenge of which one is gonna be first, the Met or 920. I think we should start doing bets on that. <laughs> um, and we continue to support, we have long, uh, many multi-year agreements with Suns Insurance, with the Hampton Inn and Suites, as well as Spring Hill Suites. Um, these are three projects that we were able to support and bring forward um, all of them in the Bradenton CRA. Um, Public Works, excellent job maintaining the river walk. We also contributed half a million towards the extension of the river walk. Um, and here you see just some pictures from the park. If somebody has not visited, it is truly serene and beautiful and I encourage everybody to go by. And here are some additional pictures during the construction. And Central CRA, our Mini Lee Rogers, our, first of all, our CCRA advisory board. Um, we we have an, uh, before you an agenda item to, to, we have an open seat there, but this board has been meeting for about a year and a half now, and they haven't, be, as you know, the feedback that we get from them, especially when it comes to the different projects has been very valuable, and I know it's been very helpful to you to make some of your decisions. Um, so we had a town hall meeting that was very successful and the community came and gave us guidance on what they would like with the Mini Rogers property. And um, 
We also did two community events of Design Your Park for MLK Park, MLK Junior Park, as well as Love Park. Very well attended, and um, it was a, it was an honor uh, at the Love Park event to actually meet uh, former council member uh, Clarence uh, Love and. His whole family was there, so a piece of history that it meant a lot, I know, to Mr. Mignon and I. Um, and finally, uh, the events that we supported, the New Year's Eve ball drop in the Bradenton CRA district, Main Street Live, you approved it last fiscal year, but it's taking place this fiscal year. TEDx Bradenton, it took place uh, September 9, 2022. <coughs> It was the first time that a TEDx event came to Bradenton, and my understanding is they're actually looking to put it together again this year. I don't think they have uh, established a, a location yet. We also did f the first time that the CRA uh, supported a Juneteenth Community Festival, and I know everybody was there, the entire CRA board and the mayor, and. Um, uh, was put together by Dr. Jefferson, but with recess education. Um, so you're having your agenda item for uh, for this year. And also we, we have to do our financials, so I won't bore anybody with all these financials that we have to include. And I would like to just call my team up here very quickly um, because I want to acknowledge all of you for your support. Um, Gingy Farmer, our public art coordinator, Karen Kaiser, KK, our program administrator, and Chris Mignon, our CRA manager. So on behalf of this wonderful dream team, we thank you, and we hope you enjoyed reading <coughs> this report. Mm. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Small but mighty team. All right. Uh, next would be all CRAs. Um, item A is gentleman here yet, ma'am? Um, um, uh, Mr. Altman said he will be in the stead of Mr. Uh, if you could wait, though, sir, we're going to actually skip forward at the request of Dr. Jefferson. She's okay. needs, uh, there's time conflict, so if you're ready to go, we're going to move ahead just temporarily to Central CRA item item nine B uh, regarding Juneteenth. Good morning. I'm Dr. Sharon Jefferson. I do appreciate you all making adjustments. I am a teacher still, so <laughs> got a, some kids waiting on me. <clears throat> yeah, me so, too. <laughs> so just definitely very grateful. Uh, I'm going to be before you all and thank you all for um, what you've been doing for the community. Thank you so much for the support of um, Juneteenth, the community festival last year. So I'm very proud to say that it is the only Juneteenth um, festival in Manatee County, and we want to continue to keep that momentum um, in support of um, the whole city of Britain, the whole county, but in, especially for the Central CRA. Um, so as you all know, Juneteenth is a national holiday that commemorates the end of slavery in the United States. On June 19, 1865, 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas. The Army announced that more than 250,000 enslaved black people in the state were free by executive decree. This became known as Juneteenth by the newly freed people in Texas. So Juneteenth is not only a time to commemorate black liberation from the institution of slavery, but also a time to highlight the resilience, solidarity, and culture of the black community. This is also a um, support of recess education and their educational programs, as well as to promote economic opportunity in the celebration of Juneteenth. So we're coming here before you all um, to um, ask for additional support, and I imagine I need to go and talk to you about a little bit about that. About what? I'm sorry. The the, the what we're asking. The request. Um, the request. They have it, so it's up to you if you want to receive the packet. Okay, you all received the packet. So, uh, it, are, do you have any questions for me? Any questions? Not at this time. It was a good. It was a very good event. Yeah. Okay. Great. 
Well, we can you make you. it a little cooler this year, then? Oh, my <laughs> God, is it starting to that? <laughs> but we, there will be a tent for cool down. Yes, yeah, we do want to have a tent, so, you know, so um, we're just really excited about what um, we have coming up. We're definitely trying to make sure that we have a highlight some youth events, um, hopefully being able to support some of our youth youth local artists so we're reaching out to some of those because we want to make sure that they're involved um so so you all are free to come out again and do some more line dancing so i appreciate your you know sharing your skills so um but it was a really really we were it was very very hot truly hot but we were just so very happy to see so many people coming out. We were definitely just really excited about the diversity because that's the message that we want to continue to send when we celebrate Juneteenth. Because as I said last year when I came before you, freedom um, is everybody's responsibility. And so we all come together to celebrate and, and definitely ensure that everyone has equal opportunity to succeed. So, and that is all. Unless there's anything else for me. I do have a picture from the line dancing. Maybe I should uh, <laughs> amend the annual report and add it in there. So <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> it was it was a great event. And, and I just want you all to know that people are so happy to see you all come out there. So, you know, they were very, very pleased to see our elected officials there. So and so are we. Okay. All right. I mean, we need some practice sessions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work with you. <laughs> Mrs. Marmy, you're looking at me. Or, or... No, I'm I'm looking at Mrs. Coach. Oh, okay. Is she gonna make an out? Uh, we we can we can work on it. Motion. Oh, I move. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> I'll second. So. Uh, for, I guess, clarification, is a motion to approve the funding <laughs> request uh, for recess education for the Juneteenth celebration. Uh, motion and second. Any further discussion? At the, at the uh, Jubilee sponsor level, correct? Correct. Yeah. The Jubilee okay. sponsor level, as noted in the presentation packet. Any further discussion? I'm right. sorry. Ms. Moore, did you, did you second it? Second. Mm -hmm. I did. Okay. It was kind. Of, it was very faint down there. So now I gotta get closer to my microphone. <laughs> my ward four representative. <laughs> we'll take the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Carries five zero. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. I'll be back at school too later today. <laughs> All right. We'll time warp back in time to uh, item six A. The Ninth Street, I'm sorry, Ninth Avenue Commercial Quarter Revitalization Presentation Next Steps, and it was supposed to be Kevin Crowder from Business Flare. However, please introduce yourself, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Peter Altman, and I am the project manager for the Tampa area. And as of last night, Kevin was to be here. We had briefed, and he had a uh, some kind of a transportation uh, problem, but um, I come to you as a member of Business Flare and the presentation, if it is queued up, I'm not it's sure up. someone can help me to get that on. It would be helpful. I think it's queued it's, up. It's, it's up. just gonna run? Okay, <clears throat> all right. Um, the presentation in a moment, but I'd like to take a moment to talk about Business Flare and what, make, what made me wanna be a part of it as an elected and board member, current board member of CRA in Newport Ritchie and having been involved in redevelopment since 1988 uh, involved on a statewide level. Um, redevelopment is something that I have always made a lifetime passion of. But the genius of Kevin Crowder as a staff person, for those of us who are board members uh, and relying on uh, the analysis and the implementation of CRA plans, uh, I'm fortunate to be a part of that. So I will be the proxy for uh, this and whatever is needed to be followed up by Kevin, we can do. Um, as you all are aware, uh, just seeing your annual report at the point at which you're six months through the current year, uh, it, was, it was very impressive. And following what's going on in Bradenton and seeing just the incredible growth and changes happening every day, restaurants moving from St. Armand's Key, uh, projects that are coming up, the excitement 
I share that in my city of Newport Ritchie because a lot of things are happening now. So it's a great time to be a board member. Uh, I'm going to step back and try to do my best to uh, replicate what you would hear from Kevin. Uh, so let's see if we can go forward. There's a keypad right in front of you. Okay. So I just hit the down. No, it's right. It should be. Oh, the, oh, the keypad. Maybe page down would work. I'll get it together. So we have a preliminary concept that we re that developed from the uh, analysis, the data analysis, and you all should have gotten that report when it was completed uh, that showed uh, a plan forward for Bradenton and included our visit, uh, which I think some of you were in attendance to, uh, in the in the community. Our objectives are to build wealth and support entrepreneurs, um, attracting investments, improving the quality of life, enhancing the tax base, all within the, the uh, parameters of, of Chapter 163. Short-term strategies and mid-term strategies and long-term strategies were discussed there. A uh, chance to jumpstart activity in that community that has uh, really is a significant location. Uh, and. You, I'm not going to read the slides, but um, this is the district that uh, starts from 9th Street East and goes to 9th Street West. And the main focus has been on the historic area that's in blue. We always talk at Business Flair about the three most critical aspects of a successful CRA uh, <coughs> plan, and that is focusing on on the aesthetics, being involved in the engagements, and the openness in the approach. We have what we call, as part of our methodology, the peace approach, where we have these five elements that, that are all critical to be able to have a successful plan in all neighborhoods. Uh, they're all, at the same time, uh, separate, separately planned for the communities that are involved. So in this case, we've identified items within that, you know, the historic charm that, that was in that district, uh, investment needed in the street assessments, public property, new construction, ways to enhance and capitalizing on partnerships and exposing the cultural significance of the area. On the preserve side, um, short term supporting legacy businesses, promoting facade improvements, midterm uh, getting those owners to invest and revitalize and long-term uh, creating that sense of place uh, and brand that celebrates what would be a vibrant destination. On the investing side, uh, the streetscapes and the right-of-way on a short-term basis, uh, slowing down traffic and, and making it walkable was a big part of the public comments that we received. Uh, the streetscape aesthetics are always part of, again, uh, a critical element. And the complete streets corridor, in the long term, uh, what will that property, what will that street, uh, how will it perform? Public property, the CRA owns a lot. There is also in that area a lot of uh, non-taxed uh, property. Uh, so uh, identifying those properties, doing some fitness fitment testing and feasibility, uh, soliciting proposals, and on a long-term basis, uh, identifying mixed-use projects and engagement spaces that can bring the community to life. Marketing, short-term, vision brochure, attracting investment, and long-term uh, corridor brand identity, and sense of place. On the enhancing side, uh, improving residential inventory, Fencing, landscaping, facade uh, in the short and midterm, and the, the density, which is always critical to any redevelopment success, uh, residential density, and improving the commercial inventory on the short term, uh, facade improvements and outdoor act space activation, and certainly in the, on the heels of the hurricane, some of the projects that would have been completed now are now looking worse than they did before the hurricane. Long-term, 
adding commercial activity adjacent to the sidewalk is a, is a long uh, recognized strategy uh, to bring life back. Capitalizing on partnerships, leveraging our, the financial opportunities of, of all the CRAs and the significance of this particular corridor as touching on all three CRAs. Midterm taking advantage of the Pirate Spring training, partnering with the Family Heritage Museum perhaps, which interestingly has a display of, the, of some of the original baseball team, uh, of the black baseball team, uh, and some of that uh, memorabilia, which does connect with, with the Pirates. Museum and then Art Vibe from the Arts District, which is right next door, and transitioning that into this neighborhood. Long-term uh, solutions on the traffic flow uh, could include putting Ninth Avenue on a road diet, and there was a lot <coughs> that was here when the DOT made their uh, presentation about their long-term plans that are being developed. So attention to the Ninth Avenue uh, performance uh, to serve the needs of the community is important. Exposing, which is the last part of our peace analysis, the historical significance, in short term highlighting and publicizing uh, the significant contributions and achievements that have occurred there. Uh, we've had Olympic athletes, uh, we've had all kind of uh, uh, innovative and active uh, members of that community that have, uh, that we could, uh, could uh, publicize and highlight this point. Midterm, <coughs> developing new events uh, and long-term uh, rehabilitation uh, and recreate some of those venues that existed. We did show before this slide that came from the museum that identified the way in which that community functioned way back in its glory days. So the history was rooming houses and housing, entrepreneurs, public spaces, gateways, restaurants, cafes, markets, and churches. Those were all in place back in the original day, and so looking to find that historical connection and recreating, recreating it with a modern, uh, <coughs> current uh, vibe is, is the plan. So the business flair approach, again, uh, has three important parts. One, the aesthetics, how, is it, how will it look? The engagement with the community, particularly the stakeholders, and your partners with the county and with your neighboring city with all that's happening now with tourism uh, and hotels and the Pirate Stadium uh, and the Convention Center and the river, uh, getting those connections, engaging those folks and making sure that this district can both contribute to the ultimate success of the city's overall economic plan and benefit from some of those improvements that are happening throughout. And an openness, which is important to let folks know that uh, you don't, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And mm -hmm. so I think uh, we've had great success with the advisory committee, the involvement, as has been mentioned before, uh, in bringing the community along to let them know that that's, that's their community and that the city cares. Once again, overall maps. And finally, in the undeveloped parcels, parking, vacant or uh, public spaces in yellow and other, uh, identifies just how much opportunity there is. Much of it is in private hands or in nonprofit hands. Some of it is, is in uh, disrepair. And a real analysis digging down there is important in order to get some of those wins that are necessary. Land values, again, are shown in the next slide. And these are slides taken out of the overall report. And this report will be printed and provided to you as well. It just shows the, the need to review and look at uh, those who might be willing to participate in, and initiate the redevelopment. I know in my city there were always folks waiting for property values and markets to improve for that first person to do something. So getting this project and activity happening on a short term uh, 
hopefully will uh, stimulate that interest from the part of the business community and investors who are out there who like to do things that are meaningful and provide for them some legacy of improvement that they've made to your city. So the initial re revitalization focus area in summary is legacy businesses, quick wins through walkability and, and quick changes that can be made to start to make the area attractive for getting out of the car, public space activis activations, uh, place brand, and developing that, uh, perhaps stimulating some micro entrepreneurial activity, uh, aesthetics on both the public and private side, um, getting those quick wins and finding a way to make these third places that folks like to go after they eat dinner, after they come into work, uh, places that are attractive and cause people to stay in town. So an infill vision is needed, uh, a destination network, uh, streetscape was one of the things that we looked at. I'll try to keep moving through this. We've had some concepts that are worthy of discussion um, and just some ideas of how you would take the existing right of way and reconfigure it. It's going to need some discussion, obviously. Um, the potential there to create a safe, walkable space, uh, safety and security being something that was already mentioned this morning as being so critical to attracting folks to out-of-towners as well as folks from other communities within the area uh, to feel safe to come to. From a potential standpoint, uh, there's a vacant piece of land right there, uh, and something like this could create that um, density that would have folks that will get out and walk. In my city, we, we recruited from Gainesville a redevelopment developer who built a mixed-use project and brought 40, 48 uh, units right into the downtown. And as soon as folks start walking around, it attracts others to come. So it's really a question of how do we stimulate that sense of, I want to be at this place through some small events. But it also requires that you have that density. And so this is just one example of a potential. Um, developing sites through infill, taking those areas that are underutilized and identifying ways to uh, stimulate interest is, I think, what we believe it to be the next steps. There are cities that are called 15-minute cities, and so it's 15 minutes. What, where can you drive in 15 minutes? <laughs> um, where can you walk in 15 minutes? So um, the idea is looking at Bradenton and its connected CRAs and, and finding ways to uh, capitalize on, uh, on the convenience of the city in terms of its size. If you go to St. Petersburg, you can drive for we drive for 20 minutes along that Central Avenue core. Uh, in Bradenton, you can walk from one district, from Arts District to this district, uh, and back to the river and to the downtown. Uh, so we feel that this city has a great opportunity to become a 15-minute city uh, that really can expose uh, and create interest to all folks who come here. 15-minute walk is a little smaller in the cloud, but you can see that it does encompass those areas. And, and so uh, I think at the meeting when we discussed the triangle site, Kevin talked about the nodes and the connectivity from different areas uh, and the importance of infill. Uh, these circles identify areas of interest. So the downtown, the village of the arts, recreation and entertainment, the Pirate Stadium, um, and the Riverwalk extension now to the east, as well as the Tropicana and those nodes. Uh, the concept, of course, is to take a look at potential infill so that the entire city's downtown encompasses <coughs> all three districts. Excuse me, Steve. Thank you. There is preservation and infill uh, and the analysis kind of shows the ability to color in those areas and try to make them as uh, continuous as possible. 
these are slides that Kevin and the genius that he has and his staff could do a much better job of explaining to me and I'll ask him, I'm sure he will come to the next uh, visit that we have to uh, give you a more powerful answer, but the bottom line is by analyzing these areas and looking at them as 15-minute city walks and the ability to connect, it allows uh, for uh, the, the goals of the CRA to remove blight and to, uh, and to lift up uh, the economics not only for business owners and property owners, but for entrepreneurial opportunities and for the residents that live there. Once again, I think we repeat this. Uh, slide as we uh, look for those areas and repeat the peace uh, approach, which is a proven approach. So every successful city has hit all five of those, which include uh, working with the city and its regulatory uh, processes to make sure that, uh, that these items can move forward. And we follow up once again and come to next steps. Uh, for us, the next steps that we would propose is that the Ninth Avenue uh, corridor is a place people want to live, to work, to invest, to run a business, to create and innovate, and to play and raise kids. Our next steps, as we see it, are market feasibility, looking at the regulatory efficiency, and importantly, the identity and the place brand for this corridor. We have proposed, uh, we have established a proposed uh, pricing for uh, the next steps. We would like to update the uh, CRA board uh, through some training on redevelopment and economic development using our approach. Uh, if you're willing and interested, we think it's important, particularly with your attorney at your meetings, keeping you on track with the obligations and the legal constraints of the chapter uh, that we work within those bounds. And uh, to do a feasibility <coughs> analysis of the businesses and the entrepreneurs that can be attracted. And I think importantly, a detailed fitment and feasibility opportunity site planning. So we've identified those areas that could be developed. They really need to be uh, further identified, explored, and prioritized given the budget constraints that you do have. And once again, this corridor does touch on all three CRAs, and so it's going to be important to work with the staff and the potential budgets and financial constraints to identify a way to activate this corridor within uh, the bounds of, uh, of the various districts, the CRA districts. Developing that brand and identity uh, would be through guidance, so making sure things are compliant with Chapter 163, and providing an implementation strategy. And I think this is one of the things that has attracted me to work with Business Flare, is that when we do work in any city, we like to see it happen. And we don't want to come in and tell you what you could do and walk away. So we would like to present an implementation strategy, which would let you know deliverables, who would do what, which of the areas of your city's CRA, city government, economic development uh, authorities, and private sector, who would be responsible, and what kind of timeline would that be, and then the attempt to follow that timeline and actually see those improvements. Uh, targeted stakeholder developer and entrepreneur engagement uh, effectively would mean going to some of those business owners engaging them directly and having that discussion. It's something we're doing in Martin County right now uh, and Stewart on the other coast. Uh, and it's, it's successful when you take those that are already existing who, who know Bradenton, and this is your city and it's your plan, uh, to find those folks and try to help to advise you as a board on uh, where the interest is and where what might be your best opportunities in terms of choosing your priorities and, and how you, you move forward. So well, that's my presentation. Um, thank you for letting me substitute for Kevin. Um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take, take them. Or comments. Comments. <laughs> um, thank you. 
again for your presentation. Uh, you, your a business flair is always has a flair about showing how genuine you are in using your expertise to guide a city into improving and, or redeveloping. Um, I, I praise you more because of how you respect the historical nature of the area. It was the black Wall Street of Bradenton, so to speak. But at that time, it was necessary, you know, uh, the community could not go elsewhere to get their clothes cleaned or enjoy a meal at a restaurant and so forth and so on. However, now is the time to revitalize that area, but integrate it into all the other redevelopment that's going on in the city because it is for the city, it, as well as the community, but the community is part of a great city. And it's just great to see that the friendly city is actually spreading and the beautiful city is spreading uh, to areas that are in need. I, I get a little emotional, so then I kind of depend on someone <laughs> else to kind of take uh, the official business stuff. But um, you definitely have a flair and um, appreciate it in putting us in the direction. And we'll guide our ways through it. You know, sorry, I'm getting emotional again. Okay, well, if you want somebody to take the spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I actually have been excited about this from the beginning. I hope that we can figure out some of our traffic issues and, and that could help with that because that's the concern is a lot of that traffic is not really intending on stopping at any of these stores. So hopefully we can put this as part of the efforts to work on that traffic. I know there's a lot of people that are working on that now, but um, I think it could, could help it if we could get the people that are just driving to Sarasota or driving to Tampa to get them somewhere else and get our real local traffic to be the people that are driving by this district. So uh, I think this is going to be awesome. Man. Um. I was going to I was also going to mention traffic um, in the course of what you're proposing do you and do you is that part of the strategy and the implementation task list addressing how we're going to deal with the fact that now this is considered to many a, a more major thoroughfare well there's no doubt that in the engagement piece that there has to be that engagement with the uh, DOT I, I had the pleasure coming up behind the 35 minute presentation you had mm -hmm. the one day at your <laughs> city meeting uh, talking about all the engagement that DOT was doing and looking at alternatives uh, we believe that the, that the, the city the city and the CRA have the authority to to take command of their street and not be told what to do uh, at the same token you understand the importance of that connectivity that you have to the beach I know there's been discussion of finding alternative ways to get people to the beach, and I think that the, that the river, the new convention center, the, the, the major hotel can provide a lot of potential visitors to your town through uh, a, a, some sort of a ferry or trolley that has been talked about, I think. I've heard the mayor speak about it and, and others when, when I visited with you all. So uh, we currently are doing an analysis of a post-hurricane bridge failure and we're identifying through our placer data, and we'd be happy to talk to uh, Katarina about incorporating that, or this is just a menu for you all to choose from. Uh, what we hope, though, is that we can continue to keep our services rolling as we had some, um, some problems last year in terms of identifying those scopes, getting those approvals, and so that's why we tried to put a menu out there and would like very much to be able to, to work as requested without having a delay of 30 or 60 days for us to get approvals. Um, but we are doing a study to show ways in which the business community that was cut off on, on the Atlantic side uh, has been impacted by the addition of an extra 30 minutes drive time for folks who normally would go in there and shop. So it's a sort of reverse uh, situation that you have now, which is finding ways to uh, move traffic 
or to simply slow it down, which is an option uh, that uh, causes the city uh, and the CRA to, to become a little more forceful in the way in which it uh, takes control of, uh, of that situation. But we have a lot of experience in that, and we'd be happy to provide both the, the information about where people are coming from and going and trying to find ways to help to reroute them. Uh, that's not uh, in, in this particular scope, but it is something that we are currently doing in other parts of the state. As a, as a quick follow-up to that, um, I would be in, I'm interested in understanding I, because I agree with you, I think that the issue with traffic is that people are trying to get to a destination and they're sitting in their cars versus knowing that this is an area that is actually the destination. Um, and to that, um, in that vein, does part of what you do involve some demographics about uh, my, my impression of the area now is that we've got some really older homeowners that have been there forever, but then that there's also a, maybe some more... Um, rental type situations and um what do we have what do we need as far as infill goes to make that a successful destination right and i, I would be happy to uh, on an individual basis uh, review the initial study we did that showed income levels age groups household sizes you know this district has the largest high household sizes it has the youngest uh, employment base, and so this is the future workers of the community, as you have other areas that are primarily 55 and over communities and older communities. So, so it's critical that you activate that asset, that human asset, uh, and, uh, and it's ready to, and I think from our meeting, our town hall that we had there at the church, it's, it's ready to get excited about something positive. Um, one of the things you mentioned on the last slide was entrepreneurship. Um, would you all actively recruit that? Would you have someone else, some other organization? Well, well, we have contacts, as example, uh, because we do some work on the private side as well, and so we have the ability to help to identify and create those programs that will, that will uh, recruit them. One of the things that we heard, you heard as well, too, is let's not just recruit somebody from out. Let's look at our skill sets that we have here and try to get those micro uh, loans or the other things. I think the city of St. Petersburg has an actual bank that is a micro loan bank. And so talking with the financial sectors and identifying ways to create incentives to have those uh, pop-up businesses. And I believe that's also part of a strategy that's emerging uh, with respect to the Pirate Stadium and some of the nearby uh, locations and certainly Tropicana over there as well so um, yes we'd be happy to help and our, our goal again is to help guide and to participate uh, on an hourly basis in working with the staff uh, to help to uh, accomplish your goals. It's one of the things I think as we look to potentially have realized Bradenton expand to touch more into other CRA districts mm -hmm. rather than just primarily downtown I think that would be a, a great, uh, their startup circle has been successful. Right. I think that would be a great area for them to focus. Yeah. Very good. So for next step, may I recommend that we, um, each one of you maybe can get together with me, give me some further ideas, some of your priorities. Uh, maybe I can answer some of the questions. We can look into it in more detail. And then combining everything, we can work something out with Business Flare and bring it back to you for your consideration. That sounds good. I think in our conversation, this is not a plan that's just going to sit on a shelf. Right. So it's no. going to be something we're going to work with. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Greatly appreciate it. Um, next in all series is resolution. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. Resolution uh, CRA 23-01 Downtown Tamiami Trail CRA Advisory Board. Make sure I said that right because I read it. <laughs> so I think we all have in front of us. There's a resolution. Resolution. Do we do we have any discussion first? Uh, we generally have a motion and a second to approve, and then discussion. Okay. 
I'll make a motion to approve the resolution of the City of Brayden creating the Downtown Tamiami Trail CRA Advisory Board. Second. All right. Motion and second. Any discussion? Yes. I have some discussion. Uh, I just was, and I expressed this um, in my meeting with Katarina. I, I don't, I, I'm afraid we're getting a, a little too um, tight on what the composition of the board should be. I'd almost rather just see it. I, I'm fine with this being, you know, the perfect board. <laughs> But I feel like maybe for as far as the resolution is concerned, it should just have the requirement that that you live and live or work in the community because sometimes it's hard to get people on these boards. And I think once we get started putting, you, you know, with the board, maybe we might have another area. I don't know. I just I was a little concerned that we were restricting ourselves too much on the composition. That was my thought. I think that that's a good point. I think as long as there's representation of people that live and work there, others who have a skill set. And, and maybe we strive to have an at-large member. Maybe we strive to have one resident. Um, but when you're talking about, especially with the two CRAs that are going to be on one advisory board, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to restrict ourselves too much, but I'll defer to council. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's a reasonable comment. We can, if that's the consensus of the board we can take it back and and revise it so would we be <clears throat> keeping the general categories as as to what would be eligible but just not being as specific as one out of each category that that sort of thing is it possible to say that this is the goal but that for right. members but that, that it's not restricted it. to it right so then i also hate to push this off any longer can we do it here <laughs> I was going to recommend for expediency, if I'm hearing you, if we strike out the language that is in under composition in the parenthesis that says one resident, mm -hmm. uh, property owner, one business related member, or one, if we scratch that parenthesis off, and also the same thing under the next one, the next uh, from the 14th Street CRA district. Then you have the legibility that guides you um, where they can either reside, own property, engaged in business. So all the mm -hmm. definitions of what you would want are under Section C, eligi uh, 6, eligibility. Um, would that satisfy kind of what y you're interested in? And then that way we I can approve so. it today. We yeah. can make the changes and we can then advertise it and i think the next process will be let's once we advertise it we collect applications and we bring it back to you and therefore you will be able to then look at the different categories and make your decision as to who should be on this board so if i'm understanding you correctly we would keep we would keep that seven members with two alternates but then we would strike the three members will be from the brain and cra one resident so the language Take out all that. just what's in parentheses. <clears throat> so you will keep the three well, members. The only thing that's in parentheses that I'm seeing is just the restatement of the numbers. Well, no, it's very specific. One resident or property yeah. owner, one business-related member, or one not-for-profit or religious entity. That's very specific. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So you so, would have three members from the Bradenton CRA, three members from, from the 14th Street. Street CRA, and then the one at-large member. Yes. And then the two alternates. So we're just going to take out the one resident property owner, one business related, and one profit, nonprofit, religious. We'll take that out of both of those, and then the rest will stay. Does that give us – I mean, but, were you looking to have people that did not – I, I might have misunderstood. No, I just don't want to restrict ours. I don't want to sit there with a vacancy because we don't have someone that's from a nonprofit or a religious entity that will sit. Right. My, I thought you were saying, though, that as far as eligibility goes, that we want to describe. No, I want to keep the eligibility. You want with, to keep it that they with have the live yes. live or work. Okay. That's pretty open. Right. Well, no, it is. Yeah. I, I thought what I, what I was envisioning was a board that had at least some number of people that lived and worked, but that potentially people that didn't live and work, but perhaps had a skill well, we have set. A, we have one at large. Okay. Uh, but the at large are... Just for the purpose of, at, like, I mean, because I agree with you, sometimes they can be hard to fill. So I didn't want to, you know, 
tie our hands if we had someone who was, you know, really I want to knowledge people on there that are strong board it's, members, not just a seat right. sitter. But right. having strong board members versus really having representation from that area is really important. So could this be that this is our, you know, ultimate wish list, but if we end up with a vacancy that we just cannot fill, then it could be a second person that fits in one of the other criteria. But it's extremely important to not just have business owners mm -hmm. or people who have some interest. It's so important to have someone who lives, works, and plays in that area. Just, just saying. But this could I be a agree. great. I just don't. I mean, my my thought was, I agree that that voice is is crucial. But does it have to be all of them? And right. right. And I will say, um, this goes to the what I've. All of the CRAs are different, mm -hmm. so while that's very important in the Central CRA and even to an extent mm -hmm. for the Tamiami Trail CRA, mm -hmm. um, I the the biz the the brain in CRA. Sometimes that's more important to have some of the business people. I agree, but you still have to have someone who lives in that area to be a part of it. I mean, you can have the business people to dictate what you know they think, but it's still important for someone who actually lives around those businesses and when they close, <laughs> they're still there. You still need that perspective, I feel, but well, I, that's just me. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I think that we have have made our desires and wishes known. I think by removing the phrases that are in the parentheses, mm -hmm. and if I'm remembering correctly, when we started working on the CCRA board, we were asked to submit names, and we're probably going to be asked to submit potential names to be contacted about this board as well. It will, of course, also be advertised and be open to the public to apply. But many times, staff has asked us to give them a couple of names to get started and get the, the conversation started. So I, I think that we have discussed what our desires are with this and know that that's what we're going to work towards. It, but if having it very specifically listed in there gives people heartburn thinking it's going to make it difficult and we have seen that at times it's difficult to get these volunteer community boards to ha to meet quorums then um again maybe I, I defer to whatever you all want to do with this. I think we need to get it going. I know that we have been talking about this. We've talked this to death. <laughs> So can so, I amend my own motion? It's well, yes, you can amend your motion, and then you have to ask the person that seconded if they will accept your amendment. Okay. So I would like to amend my motion to strike the language in the parentheses on paragraph four. Both both parentheses. Exactly. There's there's it's the same yeah. it's the same language. Yes. But it appears twice. Yes. And I will accept that that amendment. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Passes 5 0. Okay. Next is the public art focus list for 2023. Just uh, so everybody knows, point of order wise, we'll, it's looking like we'll need a break at about 10 30 unless. You all want it earlier than that. Okay. Probably about a 10 minute break. So. Sounds good. Okay. All right. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I gave you guys a brainstorm list for um, the Public Art Advisory Board. This was created in October of 22. And um, we're just now looking at it because obviously the RFQ has been what our main focus has been. But um, if you also remember, I'm sorry, I'll put it Could up. Did you put that on? Yeah, the board, good thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Like. Yep. Yes. That's good. Okay. Um, you know, the Mineral Springs Park is is on its way, and in 
February, we submitted a <coughs> grant for the Bloomberg Philanthropies Public Art Challenge. And in that grant, eight of those um, brainstorm pieces are actually in there. And so those were incorporated in the Bloomberg grant. However, we won't know until the um, end of, of spring, early summer, you know, if we get this. So what we're coming to you today, um, the Public Art Advisory Board met two days ago. We looked over this list and um, there's two items on there that came before the Bloomberg grant. Um, that is the um, district of school district of Manatee County student banner contest. And the other one is Story Walk, which came in December. Um, two nonprofits came to the Public Art Advisory Board to ask about this. So um, <clears throat> what I wanted to tell you about these two, last month, um, Jeremiah Bowman from, he's the um, arts and education um, school um, representative, he's the specialist for that. He came because we were looking for their support on the Bloomberg grant for these. But either way, we'd like to get your consensus on being able to move forward on these two projects just to get the, the information together for you and um, then present to you, you know, what we're thinking on these two, so. And that will include the financial costs? Yes, okay. yes, so um, that's what we're looking for today. So if you'll remember the student um, uh, banner contest, the Public Art Advisory Board will work with them on the judging. And we were thinking about like the Bradenton um, River Walk downtown and then through the Village of the Arts for these student banners for, for this project. And the idea was to possibly do it by the first of next year, so that's why we're wanting to get moving on that because of time, especially with students working that. The other one is called Story Walk, and that's, if you'll remember, Dr. Sheila Halpin came and she was telling us about SOAR and FOR. She actually works for the School District of Manatee, um, but is also heavily involved in the SOAR and FOR, and that is the reading readiness for children to get them ready to be on reading level by third grade. And um, Bradenton Reads was the name that we used for um, the Bloomberg grant. We could change it if you want, but you know that's. But what's nice about that is the Arts Alive celebration that was on Monday. They actually mentioned the Bradenton Reads and the collaboration that they would like to have with us on this. So, um, Story Walk is with Soren for and with a Lean on Me project. And those two are working together. And what this is, StoryWalk is already a, um, a product that you can buy and, and implement your own book. And so they have, through Soren for books that are vetted for young children to be set up through um, different panels all the way from the beginning of the book to the end so that parents or, or you know, whoever goes with the children can read those books with them. And they'd like to have them in the parks. So that's where we're, we're at. So um, we're gonna go back to the you know, Public Art Advisory Board with this if you want us to. So I just want your approval. Well, not approval, approval, but <laughs> just the consensus, I guess. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is the Wears Creek Bridge in the CRA? The Wears Creek Bridge, I no. think. Mm -hmm. Is it not? No, no it's not. Oh, ah, well, good. So See? I'm there just looking. I just was wondering. Yeah. So those are the brainstorm. Right. Like, it was a brainstorming just, session that the Public oh, okay. Art Advisor, uh, Advisory Board did. And oh, okay. They, so this they is put just it all, all in. Okay. Yeah. Just threw it all okay. in there. Yeah, just to okay. show you. <laughs> but if you'll notice the highlighted areas, those are the ones that ended up being part of what we asked for in the Bloomberg grant. And that, may I? Okay. Um, um, that was going to be a, a question that I had as far as um, the focus. Is there, and this is maybe a question for legal, is there, I would assume that there's a requirement that the pieces or the projects are within the CRA? Correct. Right. Okay. And so that's right. something that we're considering. Yeah, so thank you. I don't see a problem with bringing it back to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, next is item D, guidance on grant program language regarding code enforcement violations. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're here before you and Ms. Robin Singer from uh, Planning, the Director of uh, Planning and Community Development is here also. Um, we had a meeting with uh, Bradenton Police Department and the Code Enforcement staff um, recently. And as you know, we have updated all of our grants. So we up the amounts so that we give more funding to our residents and businesses that are in within the CRA districts if they want to improve their property. It's both for residential, um, it can be for exterior, landscaping, windows, doors, pavers, lighting. Um, so the question came, um, there's a language in those grants that says any property business with outstanding or unpaid property taxes, outstanding or unpaid bill to the city of Bradenton and or Manatee County, and or outstanding code violations will not be considered for this grant until the property or business owner provides proof of compliance. So the, the clarification we would like to seek from you today is what does it mean outstanding code violations? So when code enforcement goes to a property, um, if they do find things that need to be fixed, they send them a notice of violation and lists, these are the items you need to do. Um, they give them a period of time to do it, and if they don't, then they're being called before the special magistrate. Um, and at that time, I've been in numerous of those meetings, the special magistrate, as long as you're putting an effort, they're very flexible, they're not there to just punish people, but if somebody's truly trying um, and may have had some hardships, they give them an extension of time to do it. So the question that we would like uh, to help us with is, when can we provide the grant funding to our residents and businesses? Up to what point? Is it the point where they receive the initial letter that says notice of violation from code enforcement staff? or is it once the special magistrate makes a determination and starts applying potentially due fees to that property. Um, we do have some maps um, if you'd like additional information. Um, to help you with some of that perspective. So in 2000, and I wanna thank um, Craig, in, uh, our GIS guru for putting it together in a short period of time. So this is these are statistics from, to, from the year 2022, the calendar year. So if you're going to see um, under each CRA, you, we have listed homesteading and non-homesteaded parcels. So you will see that the vast majority, about three-fourths in each CRA are non-homesteaded. Um, and you also have the number of cases that, were, that are still open, that they started in 2022, and then that they closed in 2022. Um, so we also have a map by CRA. So in the 14th Street, Street District, um, The, you will see the yellow are the parcels um, that are homesteaded, and then the ones in the green triangle are uh, code enforcement activity that is open and the one that's red that is closed. When you take a look at, again, which violations in the 14th Street CRE district, the vast majority happened in non-homesteaded properties. And the same thing goes along all the three CRAs. So if you look at the Bradenton CRA, you will see those dots being on properties that are not marked as homesteaded. And the same picture again in the central CRA. Um, I'll let Ms. Singer come forward, um, but uh, you know, it, it, before we start advertising what we can offer, we definitely would like that clarification of when you think is more beneficial to our community to receive that funding. Um, yes, as Katerina said, um, there's some benefit when somebody has already started uh, the code enforcement process to help identify that they may need and be 
uh, able to use the funding. Um, and But if we take a strict standard on where a code violation exists, it can exist before we've even found it. So technically, if we were to say that they were going to come out and assess a property for funding, they may ask us to come out in code enforcement and find out if any violations exist. And then we're already um, ahead of where uh, the, the current language would allow us to be. In other words, we're identifying violations and now they're no longer eligible. So uh, we've had um, some CRA representatives have sat in on some of our special magistrate meetings. We find that extremely helpful because they can stand up. Sometimes we have trouble you know, making contact with people, but they'll show up for the special magistrate and that gives us an opportunity to kind of bridge that gap and say, you know, there's funding available. We can help you with your roof. We can help you with your windows um, and some other and clean up some other uh, issues that are a little bit beyond like landscaping and you know peeling paint but even painting and 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 uh, pressure cleaning are are helpful if if the Sierra can adjust with those one of the programs we're looking at starting is something we tried in the village of the arts which is sending out a postcard ahead of code enforcement action or a, a sweep so to speak um, and uh, letting them know that these are the things we're going to be looking for on this date and it kind of gives them a heads up so that they don't get cited um, and they get the opportunity to clean it up um, but but we were going to um, couple that with this program for improvements to let them know about the improvement um, improvement projects that are available through and the funding that's available through the CRA before we actually go out there and do a sweep. So there is the potential that we can get ahead of this, um, but really, by and large, you know, we think it's. Um, helpful if even after we've cited them, um, even after they've given a notice of violation, if we um, give them the opportunity to correct that or obtain funding uh, all the way up until um, the special magistrate has said, you know, I'm giving you another 60 days to clean this up and then you'll assess a fine. Once they start to assess a fine, then I would say, f you know, that we need to keep pressure on them uh, to clean up the violation. And uh, and so I think the funding uh, availability could extend up until they start to assess fines. Um, that would be my recommendation. I think that's the most helpful and, and, and easiest way to use the program that you've established. If, if I may. Please do. Um, I think that both Ms. Singer and Ms. garikos Ciaran have and I have all discussed my thoughts on code enforcement and typically what is happening in those situations. Um, I previously served as a special magistrate for code enforcement hearings in Pinellas County. And my observation was always that it's not for the bulk of them, especially when they're residential properties, property zoned for residential, not necessarily homesteaded is that those those people are typically either physically or economically unable to take care of the problem and that's how they've gotten into the situation and so while fining is a mechanism to apply pressure it's not really bringing it's not super helpful in bringing the property in compliance because they they just cannot do it um, that said i just raise as a point for the grant program that another observation in another job um, and that's doing title work and closings is that many times people especially if the home is older and and in at risk of falling in disrepair those family and again in residential context not commercial I'll I, I'll qualify that in a minute um, but those people are not necessarily doing things to clear title in order to be homestead eligible so that looks a lot like family members that think they've inherited grandma's house but in fact it's still a name of grandma so they can't they're not able to qualify for the homestead exemption um, so that said I just thought I would point out that in, in consideration of the uh, while we're talking about this program that we might just consider my thought is the, the people that should be ineligible are the people that are doing it for commercial enterprise. I, I appreciate that we don't want a landlord to be taking advantage and you know getting the funds and then not really, you know, getting the rent and not picking up the property. But I would I would just recommend that we consider giving ourselves discretion to uh, to analyze whether the property owner is operating some kind of commercial enterprise versus 
either living there or it being a situation where, you know, the, if it, to the extent that it's a rental, is it something that looks like they're renting, but it's kind of familial and it's not necessarily a true commercial. I am in the business of owning residential properties that I lease to other people. So I just raise that as a something for us to talk about and consider. And I would love to hear, you know, if, if you two would like to opine on that as well. That seems like a good idea. Maybe all of us ought to give you food for thought and then you let us know what you think, if that's okay, that's Mr. Fine. Chairman. Um, again, my conversation um, with Ms. Irons was that I was concerned about us putting money into um, property that the person who, who was living there, they were renting it. Um, they shouldn't be the one getting the citation. It should go to the property owner. And we have had a real problem in this town with people that have provided low-income housing. They're making money off of it, but they're not putting money back into the property. And there's a word for that, but I'm not going to say it in this meeting. Mm -hmm. So again, my concern is, I, I, it, it, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. yeah. because if how, how many of these situations are there where it's someone thought that they got something from a family member but they don't really have clear title and so who are we going to cite versus how many of these that we saw are rental properties that are operated by someone that I'm sorry it's a business you know, if you have five properties that you use and it's your income, that's a business. And if you're not keeping your properties up, is it, is it our responsibility to assist you to do that when you're the one making the money off the properties? So I'd, I'd have, I mean, I'm, it is, to me, it's a slippery slope and I'm trying to understand how we can interact with this and do the most good for the most people because it's truly the individuals that are living there in a in a home that is not kept up yeah and 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 that's where i i mean i completely agree with everything you just said but i think we need to keep our focus on getting that property fixed up and if someone who's doing it as a business we're still helping the person that's renting it to live in a better place and we're helping the neighbors that have to look at it and so I, yeah I don't I don't know where you draw the line or how you decide but I think our priority needs to be getting those violations corrected and bringing up the value um, and if somebody takes advantage of us, I mean, I don't want that to happen, so I don't know how you prevent it, but I think the pr priority needs to be put on getting it fixed up and getting it in compliance for safety issues, for aesthetics, for property value, all of it, so. Okay. Um, I agree with you that it, it's vital to upgrade and have an area look better. But I do feel like priority should be given to that property owner that's living in that home may not have the uh, funds or, or the ability to, to make those um, um, changes. Um, and, and, and especially in the case where here's a person that's applying for some of the funding that's there to help a homeowner. And then when code goes out and looks at it and goes, oh, we got these violations. I definitely feel like that shouldn't stop that because obviously they need, you know, the funds to assist in, uh, in, in bringing up the value and making the aesthetics uh, better. I, I just feel like there at least should be a priority. We should prioritize that it is a homestead uh, property as opposed to, I know Commercially, you know, we have a lot of rental properties in our areas that are not kept up. 
However, that's the irresponsibility of that person that's taking in that rent. <clears throat> so I do see that there is a need to help those individuals as well. But to me, that would be not the priority. And to be to be clear, I, I do not disagree. I, I and that's why I use this term that I'm kind of making up right now, commercial enterprise, because right. there I, to me, there's a and I know that legal probably can weigh in on that slippery slope and when we're going too far down it. But it has just been my observation that to me, it's pretty clear when you have the situation of a landlord that is taking advantage versus a family member letting someone live there or someone who maybe does desire to keep their, they don't care that they're not making a, a lot of money on the house, so they're charging a low rent, but they, that means they don't have as much to put back in it. Um, so I, I, that's why I desire this discretion. I completely appreciate the slippery slope argument, but that's my thought is, to me, Homestead is, is a little bit of a strict, it, it binds us a little bit more than I would prefer. I like the way you, yeah. You're right. Did you need to well, per define anything? Um, I mean, if that's the the board's consensus, I think we can craft some language that gets to the the heart of that issue. I think I think that's something we could work with. Um, I've just I'm still hearing some differences on the board, so I'm waiting to see if there's actual consensus on that. But but yeah, I think we could I think we could do that. M Mr. Chair, what's what's the differences that you're hearing? I thought we were all in agreement. <laughs> We're just prioritizing a little yes. differently. Oh, well, yeah. I think prioritizing yeah, yeah. for Homestead is yeah. completely valid yeah. because yeah. that also or, or that situation, ownership. that familiar, right. you know, kind of quasi-commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's family. <laughs> if I may, um, and I think when you talk about chronic violators, which I... I was going to use to say the term habitual, but <laughs> chronic is fine, too. Um, and, and rental property owners who are just not keeping up. They, right. that what we're talking about today, they would have already tripped probably that threshold of being collecting fines on their property and therefore not be eligible. Mm -hmm. I think with what we're talking about today in terms of once you start to accrue fines, then you're no longer eligible. I think that, that a lot of those that you're thinking about probably would fall into that category. Uh, not all, necessarily. We may find somebody who's running a rental property and hasn't properly invested and it's the first violation they've had, but, um, but I think the majority of the problematic properties have probably already tripped that threshold. And then we have the other program, which is potentially foreclosure on non-homesteaded properties that haven't been kept up and or in the w very worst conditions, uh, we're talking about demolition for unsafe structures. So um, I do think we have the other end of that, which is uh, it kind of takes care of a lot of those that we're concerned about. Um, in terms of the number of family members that have acquired the property through inheritance or because their loved one is in the, a nursing facility and just isn't able to maintain the property or hasn't actually been living in it, I, I would venture to say, and this is just a broad guess, but maybe one a month that appears uh, at special magistrates. So it's not a huge number, but but it does happen um, where we have somebody, they, they didn't even know that they were responsible for the property or that their loved one hadn't been taking care of it until they get that code enforcement notice. Mm -hmm. um, so it may not be homesteaded or it may not be that they can get homesteaded, uh, depending on the circumstances, they maybe just want to fix it up and sell it. Um, and But you know, in any case, that th those come up, and and we we're we're really looking at cases of financial hardship. Mm -hmm. um, not it's not just anybody who's like, hey, I'll take advantage of that. Um, in most cases, like when we have somebody from CRA attending uh, code enforcement, we're looking at somebody who is pleading to the special magistrate because they are they do have a financial hardship, and so we're, they're looking at about 90 days that hopefully they can create uh, complete all the work. But if you can imagine. Uh, just the difficulty of getting somebody out there to do the work um, for a roof or a window and, and pricing it out to where they can afford. Mm -hmm. um, that I think those are really the cases that we're, we're thinking we're going to help with this program. To, may I, um, and to maybe this would also, something you just said made me think that this might alleviate um, board member uh, Barnaby's concern, which is, is there anything that prohibits us from making the habitual from, so right now I believe that you said that language would be if they have accrued fines, they would be ineligible. Could we, could we actually say that it, it doesn't have to be property specific? So as an individual, if I have fines accrued against me for any property, 
in a code enforcement situation because I think that would speak to your landlord that has five properties that just doesn't care and is letting, you know, taking the money and not. I don't know. I think they could each be under a separate LLC. Right. <laughs> no, that's true, too. You know. I, I offer a point of clarification also for to further the discussion. We have four grant programs, so I think we're kind of focusing only on the residential improvements grant, where the, we have the homesteaded versus non-homesteaded, but we also have the Unchained My Fence, which could be taken advantage by businesses also, or the Restaurant and Food Services Incentive Program, or the Building and Site Enhancement Program. So I want I guess to throw out, are, are we only talking about the residential or because m my goal was to try to bring all of them because that language is in all of them. Um, so if a business is struggling, you know, COVID happened, they've been <clears throat> trying to get back on their feet and they want to upgrade their fans because they're commercial, they wouldn't be eligible. Like these are the parameters. So I know we've been talking about homestead or not, but I want to throw out another um, you know, point well, again, <laughs> uh, you know, I want to get rid of those chain link fences. So. Oh, I, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Whatever <one>. it takes. <laughs> so. And I, I, yes, I, I don't, I, my thought is um, that within the four grant programs, it, it would be more a matter of what, what do they need? What are they utilizing? If it is a, if it's a commercial property, a commercial endeavor, um, do they have to have this one or can they do the one that is unchain my fence or the exterior uh, grant you know in other words what, what are more appropriate use of the funds um, and, and that might speak to numbers you know miss singer might say oh we got we have so few that it's fine if if some commercial enterprises are eligible for the one that we're kind of kicking around the homestead versus non-homestead um, but I, as far as like targeting dollars i would say commercial in in the context of a, a property that is zoned residential if it, my, in my head, again, the, the delineation is between someone operating a commercial enterprise, Miss Barnaby's landlord, versus just, you know, people that are, are doing the best they can, that may not mean they have title. And then to Miss Coker's point that we do just want to get it cleaned up, the goal of corn enforcement in my mind is always just get the property in compliance. Is Would a solution be, if I'm hearing the consensus, that um, you all seem to be that you don't, we don't want to just throw the hammer at the very beginning. We want to give that opportunity to somebody up to the magistrate. So if we use that thought process for all of the grants, then once they apply, they do come back to you. And in there, we do say may or may not qualify. So therefore, at that point, you'll have all the information before you. And if you feel this is the landlord that we're not going to use the language today, we'll okay. say, hey, you, yeah. we're, we're not going to, um, to approve you. So it, would that be a compromise that you all kind of are? Uh, I'm just have been hearing what you're saying, and I'm trying to summarize it. For me, I it's not necessarily a timeline, although accruing fines or being a chronic or habitual offender is uh, is that. In, uh, to clarify, versus a timeline, I would say that speaks to bad behavior. We don't want to reward bad behavior, but we also I would like the discretion to not punish in a, you know, more innocent type situations. Well, Unintended, I guess I could traditionally say. Traditionally, in the city of Bradenton, code enforcement is has come from the standpoint of we want to bring properties into compliance, not that we want to punish people. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have worked, I think, very diligently to try to get assistance to people when we have discovered there was a situation where perhaps it's it's a new widow and she doesn't know how to do things and she needs some guidance and and or her you know her her partner or husband always handled the yard work and she doesn't know how to hire somebody to do the yard work and she doesn't know how to work the mower and this sort of thing so we've always tried to come from I, I think from the area of being compassionate first, particularly if you're talking about a situation such as that, particularly if it's a homeowner. Um, the times that I can remember that where we've gotten pretty stern with individuals, 
again goes back to those bad apples that um, want to spoil the whole bunch. And they're, they want to take the money and run and not be responsible for providing a safe place, a domicile that, that has what it needs. And I, I've never, I have never been a landlord. That's not something I've ever aspired to. Um, so I, I, but I could imagine there, there are a lot of issues that, that go on with it. But if you are going to have a business and you're going to operate it in the friendly city, you need to operate it according to the rules and regulations and try to be a good neighbor. Maybe the answer is yeah. the, the Well, prior, I, I don't the think I have an answer system. to that. But um, um, some decades ago, <laughs> Code enforcement did have a pretty bad reputation, though, that it was an opportunity for the city to use it to code violate, code violate, code violate, rack up the dollars and the fines, and then we take your property. So, but that was a, a long time ago. We're talking, I guess, late 80s, early 90s. I don't know what it went, well, but, but it does still have that taste in some, some mouths. But the, the truth is now that code enforcement is trying to lift up areas and, and not, it's not to hurt, it's to help. Um, so I, I just had to say that there are some of us that remember and I when they did really do it. And I didn't mean to punish, I yeah, just meant but they, to, to the yeah. concern. It's a valid concern, I think, to not want to reward bad behavior. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think perhaps, again, that staff and our, our CRA attorney has heard what we've said and perhaps they can craft something to bring back for us to approve at our next meeting perhaps yeah I think we can do that okay okay all right um, since it's real close to 1030 we're going to take a brief recess for 10 minutes yes we'll be because I think the next yeah, next we're not thing gonna, on the we're agenda gonna is going to take a while. I was afraid you weren't going to do that. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stand it, recess until 1040. Whenever. <clears throat> All right. The time is 1041. We'll go back in session. Uh, next topic is 14th Street CRA, Tamiami Trail CRA. Pardon. A uh, request for use of CRA-owned vacant lot as event space. Sarah Wertheimer, embracing our differences. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair and, and CRA board members. I'm very grateful to be able to speak with you today and share more about embracing our differences. And I do believe we have the presentation they're pulling up now. So you can have some visuals. More. And then... Yes, and then I also, um, that is different than what is on the PowerPoint. Um, that is actually the full exhibition for this year, for 2023, which is our 20th anniversary. So I do wanna give you just a little bit of background and history of our organization, but I thought that I would start with just sharing our mission and vision statement. So the mission of Embracing Our Differences is through the transformative power of the arts, we educate and inspire to create a better world. We envision a world that embraces diversity, respects differences, and actively rejects hatred and prejudice. So really, this is our 20th anniversary. We are thrilled to be celebrating this milestone and really thrilled to be celebrating kindness and respect. That is what our organization strives to, to promote in our community. So we were originally started 20 years ago as a traveling art exhibit that was brought to our community from uh, Jerusalem, Israel. The Florida Holocaust Museum brought this exhibit here and they brought it all around the world at that time. And we had amazing co-chairs, Dennis and Grassi McGillicuddy, as well as the late Carol and Carol Buchanan, who thought that this was so important and so meaningful that this is something that they needed to do every year. So they incorporated the organization the next year started doing our own call to artists, and really started growing our education programs from there. So when we did our first call to artists, we received 124 submissions. This year, we received 13,733 submissions. Let me pull out this again. 
from 119 countries, 45 states, and 424 schools. So it's student and adult artwork, amateur and professional artists and writers from around the world. And they are really here to share with us their own messages, their interpretations, their feelings, what they're going through, and really trying to celebrate coming together as a community and celebrating our unique attributes and talents and experiences, and also our shared common humanity, really how much we do have in common with one another. And so that is is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build up the confidence and self-esteem in our youngest students so that when they're in school, they're not worried about who's gonna be bullying them and who's gonna be picking on them today. They can actually focus on their academics. They can succeed so much more in school when they don't have to fear those external um, distractions and, and pressures from those around them, when they can really focus on, on what's important and they can learn to succeed in a group environment in the classroom, but also later in life in the workplace. We all know how much more successful any business or any work environment will be when we have diverse perspectives there at the table. And when we have different representation from different individuals, different groups, different life experiences. So that is what we are trying to promote, is really trying to bring people together to celebrate who we are as individuals, but also who we are as a community together. So I did want to um, share with you some images of the exhibit so that you can really get um, a scale, uh, a scope of what the exhibition is and what these billboards look like when they're blown <laughs> up to 12 and a half by 16 feet. It's a pretty special experience. So this was our grand opening celebration for this year that we had at Bayfront Park. So you can see our uh, board chair, the Honorable Judge Charles Williams, speaking to a crowd of about 3,000 attendees that we had at our grand opening celebration in mid-January. And um, we were thrilled to have the uh, mayor of Sarasota, as well as the city manager, and uh, three of the commissioners join us for that fantastic celebration. And um, we're there with some of our board members as well. And we were presented a key to the city of Sarasota, which was a huge honor for us and, and really just a special moment to, to celebrate all of the incredible artists and, and writers who shared their work with us. Um, something that I didn't explain about the competition that people don't often know is that it's actually two separate competitions. It's visual art and creative writing. They're submitted separately to different committees, judged blindly, so we have no idea how old anyone is, where they're from, or anything about them. And then we match those together at the end. So when they go through almost 14,000 submissions, they're selecting the top 50, and then that's what goes on display at the exhibit, is those 50 best pieces. So here you can see a drone photo, so you can kind of see how large these pieces are with the individuals next to them. So these are a bunch of kids on field trips to the exhibit, which the field trips really are such an important part of what we do. Our education program is really the most important part of our organization. These field trips are completely free for our students because we pay for the transportation. And, and for a lot of our kids, especially in Title I, low-income schools, it's the only field trip they have for the entire year because they can't ask parents to pay for anything in addition. So it's such an incredible experience for them to be able to open up their eyes, but also to experience the arts in a completely different way. A lot of times in a museum, you feel like you have to be on your best behavior, hands by your sides, you know, you can't, can't speak, can't interact. This is totally different experience with the artwork in this, this massive size, but also in an outdoor setting. So here you can see, um, we have a lot of different topics that are represented every year. So we've had a lot that are dealing with disability. Um, and so that's what this beautiful piece here is. And this is a field trip we have. Um, and then this was our grand opening. So the exhibit is currently on display in Northport at Butler Park. And we just had our grand opening this past Saturday. We were thrilled to have the mayor, the city manager, uh, vice mayor and commissioner with us in celebration. And they were able to share remarks about the importance of this in um, one of the, the fastest growing cities in our area. And, and so it was a really special opportunity to, to celebrate and come together. So you can see the exhibit on display at Butler Park. It definitely has a different vibe or different feel in every community, and, and that's what makes it so special. This is where we are hoping to have the exhibit in Village of the Arts. Um, so this is the property right by Bird Rock Taco. And we were able to go around to all of the galleries and the restaurants and the shops and really get to talk to the owners about this, this 
once in a, a lifetime kind of opportunity to get recognition for the area, to really put it on the map, and to bring so many visitors in who clearly appreciate the arts. They're coming there to to get to experience the arts through our exhibit, but then they'll get to walk through the incredible village of the arts and go into the galleries and enjoy the restaurants and, and really be able to, to brighten up the entire community. And every year we have special um, awards. We have our best in show adult artwork, best in show student, best in show adult quotation, and best in show student quotation. So this is this year's best in show adult artist. And this is an artist from Brazil who is actually currently raising money um, with the goal to come here uh, for our grand opening in Bradenton that we are hopeful to have uh, April 29th. So she will be traveling from Brazil, um, this young woman, to, to join us to really celebrate this, this incredible accomplishment for her, um, which would also be fantastic news and, and a very large news story, this woman traveling from Brazil to be here with us. Um, so this piece is really all about representation. And, and she modeled it after or was inspired by um, Vermeer's painting, A Girl with a Pearl Earring. And, and really did want to show how much it means to someone when they see themselves represented and, and how they're able to then feel valued and feel beautiful. Like they, they do exist and, and they are worthy of being in an incredible painting in a museum. And this is our best in show student piece for this year. This is from 10th grade student Alexis Lee, who did travel from California for our grand opening in Bayfront Park and joined us. Um, we actually had artists come from all over the country to, to celebrate with us, and which of course is fantastic for tourism as well and, and for all the dollars that they were spending while in our community. Um, but this 10th grader really wanted to cover a pretty serious topic. <laughs> Uh, body image has been a topic that has been more and more common over the past few years in our exhibition. And she wanted to bring light to body dysmorphia and how dangerous that can be for so many people. She's gone through this personally herself, but she actually created this piece in honor of her friend who at the time was in the hospital suffering from anorexia. And she wanted to talk about how serious and deadly this can be when so often we, we look at media, we look at social media, we look at magazines and think that beauty has to be one particular thing. And if we can't fit that model, then we must not be beautiful. We must not be valued. And how dangerous that can be for so many people. It, it honestly doesn't have an age limit on it. It's not just for females. There are so many people who go through these challenges. And so, so many people have connected with this piece in a, in a very serious and very meaningful way. So those are just two of the artworks out of the 50 that are on display in this year's exhibit. I did give you catalogs so that you can see all of the artwork that is on display, um, that was on display at Bayfront Park and is currently up at Butler Park. Um, but really, all of the topics are, are so varied, and I often say it's like an emotional roller coaster. There are pieces that are really lighthearted and inspirational and funny, and there are pieces that are more intense and emotional and thought-provoking. And that's the point, is to really start conversations with one another but also different people are going to connect with different art pieces different people are going to like different art pieces and that's what's great about art is that everyone's able to look at it from their own perspective and you don't have to like everything you don't have to agree with everything it would be pretty boring world if we did all agree with everything and everyone so that's not what we're trying to do we're just trying to open up people's eyes and minds and really help them see the importance of treating one another with kindness and respect and, and not having to agree, but just knowing how to talk, how to converse. And, and when we do our field trips to the exhibit, we actually have our high school students who we train in partnership with Ringling Museum. We train them to lead the, the younger field trips as docents in the park. And they use a pedagogy called visual thinking strategies. And it's very student driven. So when they go on a field trip, we don't tell them what this art piece means or what the artist intended or what they should think about it. Instead, we're asking them questions. We start with, what do you see in this piece? What makes you say that? What more can we find? So it's very much a conversation and really seeing from their point of view, from their unique life perspective and experiences, what they're seeing in that artwork and then having a discussion about it. So it's a learning experience for everyone, but it's also just a really fun cultural way to see that 
someone in, in Serbia might be going through the same struggle that I'm going through here in, in Bradenton, um, or, or that people of all ages, we, we do have so much in common with one another. And, and that's, that's our goal. So um, I did want to also uh, emphasize that this will not cost the CRA or the city any dollars at all. We fund the entire thing. We pay for, um, of course, all of the, the banners going up, the actual installation, but also security cameras, um, off-duty police officers during our field trips, uh, anything that's needed, all of the expenses for a grand opening celebration, we cover all of that. So it wouldn't cost the city anything or the CRA anything. If anything, it would be bringing money into the CRA and specifically into Village of the Arts. So um, I am happy to answer any questions, but I am grateful to be able to, to talk with all of you. Uh, I have one question first, it's for Katarina. What is the condition of the lot that they're proposing? I, obviously it's not that little, that little, you know, with the homes on it, but what's the condition of it as far as footing, as far as stability? Uh, because I think liability wise, CRA and the city can't afford to have a, a messy site there, basically. So the first thing we did for liability is we went to the specialist to find out what would be the requirement that they would need to have. So they committed that they would uh, add the CRA and the city and take out the liability in the, in the amount of $2 million, which would satisfy that from the city perspective. We did go and walk the lot. Uh, there's areas that it's pretty straight, and there's a few areas that it's a little bit more lumpy. So we tried to figure out what would we need to do to make sure it's more even. So I believe, and I wasn't there, so maybe Ms. Farmer can confirm, but she spoke with Mr. McClellan, the director of public works, who said that, let us know what you need to do and we can do it. Um, so. It can be done. I don't, I, you know, if something doesn't need to happen, it can be fixed. Uh, but, but I don't know exactly what we'll need. Probably public works would be the best ones to let, to come and say, okay, we'll do this and move forward. You're confident that something could be done by this deadline or their opening of the 29th of next? It will be very tight. Um, I, Ms. Farmer, did you have any more discussions with them? Did they... I did talk with um, Jim McClellan, and um, I think they're going to be able to get this done. Because if you've looked at those other places that were there, it's just a leveling out sort of thing. And what's cool is there could be places where they put those things that if it's an indented area, they can kind of place these where it might be one of those more problematic areas. Okay. All right, fair enough. Has an event permit? I mean, have they gone through the whole process? I talked to Kelly, and because this is a CRA, that's a different, it's not under that um, thing. We would have to have our own permitting process, so. Any event um, in the city has to have a permit, doesn't it? That was just per Kelly, that's what I was told. I find that we hard could, to We could put that through paperwork, though, I mean. And, and the next week is where it goes through fire and and right. police yeah. and would, all the requirements. How many porta potty? I mean, all of that that's has not what to I be. We're getting today was that. And and yeah. No. Um, next week is a is it next week? Yeah, um, cool. an event um, meeting. So I could take it to them. Well, I just, we have a process, and it doesn't. I mean, I was told we weren't part of the process because we're the community redevelopment agency. I I disagree with that. I, I don't I, know where that's coming from. So, yeah, I mean, no, I don't. I don't know off the top of my head what our special event. Uh, you know, I I know it's generally for public property and right of way areas that are being used for events. I don't know if this <clears throat> meets those requirements or not, but we can look at that. Um, well, who's making application, I guess, is the first question. Uh, and we haven't gotten an application. The application in fact, would I'm be only embracing our differences. content here now. And so um, I'm curious about the process. I Wh who's making application? The CRA? It would be the embracing our differences. Okay. And you're saying that it'd be exempt because the event takes place in the CRA? That's that's the advice I was given. Well, doesn't the festival, I mean, any art walks and stuff, doesn't that have to go through? 
May I? Yeah. yeah. Jean, when you and I spoke. Could you speak into the microphone, please, for the when, record? When you and I spoke a week or so ago, um, <clears throat> we talked about the, the um, event application and process. At that time, Jean was informed that that was not necessary because the event itself is being held on CRA-owned property. Uh, whether or not that makes sense, I don't know, but I, may. I believe that came from from Kelly, who is the events coordinator. I think that um, what I, what I'm understanding just from this conversation, I've not talked to Kelly about it, but what I'm hearing is the events process with the city is for events that are to be held on city property. This property is located within the city, but it is not owned by the city and is not a public right of way. So I could imagine that Kelly's reasoning is she doesn't uh, govern what an entity does with its own property. You know, I think she's probably likening this to if embracing our differences owned the lot and decided to put the art on it. It's between us as the entity, the CRA, and embracing our differences. That's that is the lawyer answer. The understanding. So, <laughs> uh, how about the official? I mean, is that? accurate or I like I said I don't know off the top of my head I mean that makes sense and that was kind of what I was thinking was that this is not city property or right-of-way um, so it could be a different scenario I think maybe the question for today is just is the CRA board interested in um, in putting this here and then we've got I don't know what is it a month to take it through those processes that are required if if they're required if they're required and, and we're probably going to want an agreement with embracing our differences as well because we always want to address you know indemnification and liability issues whenever we have somebody doing work on city or cra property okay thank you gene all right and um, i did hear you say that there would not be a cost to the cra that you would cover off-duty policing and yes. I'm guessing um, also cameras. maintaining, you know, yes. standard, you know. We maintain it as well. Our crew will come out, yes, and we would be paying for the porta potties or anything else that's needed. Um, if trash cans are needed, recycling, anything like that, um, we would pay for that as well. And from the picture, when I saw it, and you said this was adjacent to, to the restaurant Bird Rock, is it Bird Rock? Yes, there's it's good food, one little property good. right between that, yes. Um, and they are all okay. Oh, they were thrilled about it, yes. Of course that are. was gonna be my other question was yeah. well, whether um, Ms. Farmer wanted to speak to any involvement that she's had in the community and what their response was. Well, I have quite a few cards here of people okay. that want to. So before we go into more in depth, maybe uh, yeah, let welcome. the community speak and then you can sort of address at the end of community comment. Absolutely, comments. I would love to. Thank you very right. much. Uh, first is Matthew Farmer. Huh. Wonder who that guy. Uh, economic impact of embracing our differences. Coincident. Good morning. Uh, again, I'm Matthew S. Farmer. I am currently the interim president of the Artist Guild of the Village of the Arts. It's my pleasure to be here today to speak about this issue. As I look at it for the village, there are two things that I see as a great value, and not just for the Village of the Arts, but for the city of Bradenton. And it is one, with would be exposure. The Village of the Arts is an ongoing thing. I have been there for eight years. It's amazing how many people, even from the city of Bradenton, come for the first time and go, I never knew you were here. So the exposure that this would bring throughout the state of Florida, because as I understand it, many people travel from the outside the area. What a great exposure to our community. Again, not just the Village of the Arts, because they're gonna travel through our community, they're gonna see the wonderful things that we have, the wonderful restaurants we have, our beautiful parks, is an overall positive for the exposure of the city of Bradenton, and obviously, yes, for the Village of the Arts. The other issue that I see is the financial impact that it will provide to the city of Bradenton and the Village of the Arts. I have heard a number, and I would be thrilled if this number were to happen, but at one point, 371,000 people came through this art uh, piece. Think about that. 
Now, even if we get 50,000, what is the financial reper repercussions within our village? Average, 12 to $15 per restaurant. Then we add on top of that the taxes that will be paid from those people coming through, getting gas, getting pop, eating, uh, all those things. It, it's just a, an amazing piece that will add to the value of our community. And when I say our community, again, I am privileged to live here in the city of Brainton. I've owned my home for nine years, lived here eight years. It's a wonderful city. And then again, the value to the village of the arts it's very hard to really put a number on it, but again, exposure and the financial repercussions, this is a positive. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, Valerie Borselman. Hi. Hello. Good morning. I'm Valerie Borselman. I live, work, and play in downtown Bradenton. Um, I've lived in the village since 2001, and I've been the art teacher at Ballard Elementary School also since 2001. I've submitted student artwork to the Embracing Our Differences exhibit almost every year. My students' work was actually in the exhibit in 2007 and 2015. And uh, last year, I was involved in the Ambassador Program, which is a great professional development program for art teachers. So full disclosure, I really love this exhibit. Um, the Village of the Arts is an ideal location for the Embracing Our Differences for many reasons. The centralized location, a built-in art audience, surrounding neighborhoods of diverse populations, proximity to schools, and the importance of the message to our kids and our citizens. First of all, the village is centrally located within Manatee County, giving all of our residents a fair chance to visit. The Village of the Arts already has a built-in audience of art lovers who are comfortable walking around as they visit our galleries. The added foot traffic would be welcomed by our thriving community of artists and businesses. Our immediate non-artist neighbors within our little community are also pretty amazing people. We have a very racially and ethnically diverse neighborhood, and these folks are used to living with public art. We have sculptures and murals and music throughout our neighborhood all the time, and um, I foresee no problems with that. Most importantly, though, and Village of the Arts is an ideal location for the exhibit because it will bring art to some of the most vulnerable populations in the county. Located in the downtown area of Bradenton, the Village of the Arts is within walking distance of two Title I schools, Rogers Garden Elementary and Ballard Elementary School. Both schools and the surrounding school zones are pretty culturally diverse and also have a high, uh, very high uh, level of poverty. Students in poverty don't often have access to high quality art experiences. Although I try as hard as I can and my fellow teachers as well, we can't level the playing field alone. And although the Village of the Arts are open to the public, Due to economic or cultural differences, or maybe language barriers, some of our neighborhood families don't often feel comfortable walking into the art galleries. However, many of my students are aware of the outdoor public art in the neighborhood, and they visit uh, as trick-or-treaters every Halloween. We have tons of kids that come through our neighborhood. Our Dia de los Muertos celebration fills the city streets with a diversity of visitors and neighbors alike. So historically, I think an outdoor exhibit would be very welcoming to all types of families and they would feel comfortable attending and really enjoying the event. Um, I also love that EOD pays for the buses to the exhibition, as you heard. Um, the school bus buses will also usually take the students to a secondary location. Um, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds. Mark. Okay. Um, and so that could also benefit some of our local businesses, such as the Bishop Museum. Um, many of my schools have gone to the field trip in Sarasota, although my families uh, don't have the extra time or gas money for a return visit. Um, having the exhibition here in the village, it would take just a few hours out of our school day to visit, and our kids could be back for lunch. It would also encourage our students to walk over with their families and really keep that dialogue going. This message is so important for our kids. They need to know, sorry, <laughs> They need to know that they belong in our society. They need to know that they see the possibilities for themselves and feel hope for a positive future. 
and that's what EOD is all about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next was uh, His Honor Ed Nicholas. However, I believe he had to leave. Ashley Brown. Ashley had to leave. Ashley had to leave. You, I think Mrs. Nicholas is here. Does she want to speak? In his. Does stead? she speak in his stead? She can. I will allow that. Yes. It's better. I'll probably regret it, but. <laughs> Please Anne give your name yeah. for the record. Anne Marie oh. Nicholas, resident, Manatee County. It's artwork. Artwork designed to invite conversation and discussion. How is that a bad thing? Indeed, for years, Manatee County bused students to the display. For 20 years, this display was not controversial. It was sought after. How is artwork that encourages conversation a bad thing? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Next is Tori Natras. Okay. Um, and Bill Webster. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, just, I, I moved on. Yeah, Terry Natras. I did. Yes, I'm sorry. My Good morning, fault. Council. How are y'all doing? Hello. I'm gonna I'm gonna tread lightly because I think I have a very vague point to make. It might sound political, but it's not. I I, I don't care much for politics. Uh, recently in February, my sister, who's an art director in uh, New Orleans at a museum, sent me an article that SCF was removing this wonderful exhibit due to the words inclusion and. Inclusion, thank you. The microphone. <laughs> I'm 5'10", I'm, it's it's, I'm up here. Lucky girl. The, the exhibit was removed for the words inclusion and diversity. This is a quote, okay? And I just, real quickly, inclusion is the practice or policy of providing equal access, opportunities, and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Diversity the practice of quality of including or involving people from a range of different social and ethnic backgrounds. Now, I have lived in the Village of the Arts for 10 years. I've been a homeowner for four years. I also owned an Airbnb, currently own an Airbnb, and I am actually the closest property to this. I immediately cross the street, I'm the closest property. And I know for a fact that I live in a city, Manatee County, Bradenton, that is above, in so many ways, a lot of other cities in America. I think we practice being progressive in a way that includes everyone, not just a certain group, and most importantly, the economic differences this will make for this immediate area we're, we're, we're out of breath with this one. Right now, this area is kind of being taken over with vagrants, and I know that's a touchy subject that we have to try to handle at one point, but for now, I think it's important to fill up the space with active activities and healthy businesses, and I'm just gonna leave off with, I have spoken to so many of my neighbors. There's really not a person I don't know and everyone's so excited about the possibility of this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And last is Bill Webster. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you for having this uh, meeting. I'd just like to say quickly and succinctly that this is a perfect fit for the Village of the Arts uh, for all the reasons that you've been told. Uh, I think that uh, many people that have left already because of time were about to say that they agreed with the idea as well. And I just like to see a can-do attitude. You know, there may be this little glitch or that little glitch, but you know, we can definitely do this. I think everyone knows that. So uh, please uh, vote in favor of it. And thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. All right. 
Yes, G. Your husband already spoke. <laughs> John and Amanda Horn. Oh, I had to yes. leave, but they asked that I didn't, their I, I letter know be written. I still had here. Okay. John and Amanda Horn, I know. Were they just would like to have it their letter read for the oh, record. Oh, okay. I don't. It's in the group of stuff I gave you. Oh, that was the letter from her. I thought that was from. No, I gave you a whole packet. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh boy. <laughs> Did everyone want those read in, or just? Um, I think, I think if you just said their name, and okay. those are all in support. So. Okay. Well, I'll go in order. Okay. Uh, Kimberly Ro Roberson Hoy, uh, teacher at Gene Wood Elementary, um, is in favor. Um, this is not going to be a Will Robinson move, by the way. I, just, I was just thinking <laughs> that. So we're clear. Make sure Anita's not on there. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, Brittany Branager, uh, Rawat Middle Visual Arts teacher, is in favor. Um, they actually have two stu art two art pieces in the exhibit this year, so that's good. Uh, Tom Brader, um, board member of Mansi Community Foundation, is in favor. Oweni Sokos um, cannot make the meeting today. She is in favor. Karen Barber is in support john amanda horn do they want the entire letter read or just okay uh good morning Ms. farmer we would love to attend thursday city council cra meeting to show you our support for embracing our differences and their desire to fund and place their art exhibit in bradenton's village of the arts we can't think of a better way to share differing ideas and ways for everyone to look through a lens maybe they haven't looked through before and those that have to embrace their story being told as well. The more people that are exposed to opinions and visions, whether through town halls, neighborhood porch gatherings, or via an art exhibit, the better our community can grow. We are a very diverse community and we love it every day. Let's embrace our differences and open our hearts and eyes to learn and better our community through education and through the arts. Thanks for your commitment to Bradenton. Yours is a tough job. Please allow EOD to show Bradenton and Mantis residents their arts. We appreciate your consideration. It's all the best. Signed, John and Amanda, John Amanda Horn, and Marie Oyster Bars. Uh, additionally, Carrie Price um, had a three points that she wanted to make. Uh, she is a resident of the village, uh, I'm sorry, business owner in the village, and uh, is in support. And Michael Zucker unable to make it today but would like to voice his support for the event and i will give these back to you to put somehow into the record of today okay great all right okay i'll open it up to uh we'll have some discussion mr chairman yes ma'am um I had some questions that did not get answered, so I, I may need to have either Miss Farmer or I'm I, I'm not going to call no I'm not going to call you by your first name I'm trying to come up with your last name so okay Miss Wertheimer thank you um, the, the questions that I had before was was there going to be security there and who was going to be responsible for it. Um, I was concerned about the possibility of a home, uh, hold harmless agreement. This is a piece of property that had several homes on it that fell into disrepair. The CRA bought them and we leveled the homes. There has not been any further site work done at that property. And so um, that was one of my questions was, were we gonna have some sort of hold, hold harmless? Because it's, it's not, it's, it's raw land right now. It's not designed as a park. It's not designed with walkways. When I was looking at the pictures of where this exhibit has been before, um, I, I, I was contrast and comparing and then the other thing was, is that if there's 50 pieces of artwork, is that approximately 16 to 17 of the tripod sites? And have we seen, because that, from what I'm seeing, what you're showing me, in a park setting, it's, it's spread out. And 
this is not that big a piece of property. Are you going to be culling the exhibit and maybe putting some up at some time and some up at another time? Have you worked it out to see if there's, if, if we're able to have all the pieces there and have safe walkways there? Um, I, I, I don't know this. I mean, this is just, I come from a not-for-profit background and every event that I look at, I think liability first. Absolutely. Um, so yes, we would have that in the agreement. That's in our agreement with the city of Sarasota and the city of Northport um, is a, a hold harmless kind of um, clause. Um, and then uh, we do feel confident that we could fit all 18 tripods um, there on the property. Uh, and, and there would still be um, safe ways to walk throughout. We have walked the property a good amount and, and it really is just small little areas that, that kind of have little mounds or, or some materials left over. Um, like what Jean was saying, our tripods could actually go over those so that no one goes underneath them anyways. Um, and, and they are 16 by 16 by 16 is the size of the tripods. Um, so, so we do feel confident that we can fit all of them there. Um, and we have had the exhibit as well at Benderson Park in the past, and that was in a much more condensed area. And, and it still worked really well. And it doesn't have sidewalks all throughout. It has sidewalks just on the perimeter just like this. Um, so there are still pieces that people can visit that are handicap friendly because they can go through on the um, sidewalks. However, um, there are places that you, you would have to walk through the grass or, or like. And then there is one other thing that no one has broached up here or that I've gotten any information on. Um, 12th Street, we are doing the stormwater project, redoing 12th Street. And that is torn up right now and it's it started at 9th and it's going to head down to this property and i'm wondering how that affects people's ability to get to it as well as you're talking about bringing in children with school buses and that sort of thing it would be very difficult to unload on 13th because that road it just travels there's so much going on there so you would have to unload someplace else but and we don't have anybody from public works here but I am concerned about that road work because of two things. One is, if it if it's happening, then we're we're going to be driving hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of people into an area that's under construction. And number two, we can't put that road work off because that will negatively impact the businesses that operate along that street right now. So, again, I am focusing more on liability safety and how we can could possibly do this art to me is very subjective the only thing i can paint is that wall poor miss paul who was my art teacher at ballard would say to me marianne i always appreciate your effort <laughs> which as i got older understood that to mean girl give it up you ain't got a prayer of a chance of becoming an artist. So I appreciate art, but I, I'm not going to get into the subjectivity of art. I'm, I, I'm more concerned about the site, security, how it, how it would all work out. So I can't answer anything about the um, construction, of course, because I do not know that. Um, I will say when it comes to the school bus drop-offs, our plan is there is that um, driveway kind of leading into the property that the buses would be able, we wouldn't have the artwork right there. The buses would be able to pull onto that to drop off at least, so they would be able to come off the road to do those drop-offs. But if they can't back up, back out of it onto 12th because it's torn up, you might yes, need to rethink that. that's I don't know about that part. That is news to me. Okay. We'll keep note of that. Um, you are. I think further to that, I, I mean, that's why we put th these events through that process for the city. We, when we purchased that property, it was intended for parking. <laughs> so f uh, up front, I mean, that was the only thing we really contemplated. If we're going to use it for events, then maybe we need, if we can't use the system that the city has, I don't know legally if that's a problem, um, just because it's CRA designated property I, I mean it's still public city and cra um i don't know if we I, I just feel like for us to sit here and debate the transportation or fire or any of that is without any input from without any input from fire. them that's why we have that 
in process. So I don't know if it's possible to make it go through that. Um, you know, as Councilwoman Barnaby said, um, it's probably not right to get into the subject matter here. I, um, I actually have enjoyed this in the past. It's a great event. It's perfect as to the appropriateness of being public with tax on tax dollars. I have questions with that, and that's why I'm wondering if this is the public art that's bringing this to us, or if it's just someone that's wanting to to come in. I feel I'm feeling like public art is trying to push this, and we had expressly discussed not being provocative with public art. So I need to, in my mind, have a comfort on that. And that's so, not your problem. <laughs> how this happened is because of the Bloomberg grant, um, I was um, introduced to Sarah. So she came to me asking me about the property because um, I said, we have an event committee. You can talk to them. She was wanting for a place in the city. So um, where they've gone before is in the pavilion and it's being turfed right now. And I just said off the top of my head, hey, the Village of the Arts has a CRA property. It might work, it might not. You wanna take a look at it. And that's where this all started, so. So that didn't really answer my question. <laughs> are you doing this as the public art coordinator or are you just doing this as a member of the village? I, as a member of the village, basically. Okay, okay. Well, I mean. And being in the CRA property, I mean, the CRA, I knew about the property, so. Anything else? Not at, at this, this moment. At this moment. <laughs> Going back to you, you're taking care of the cost of policing. So how do you gauge, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> how do you gauge how many officers you're going to need and and how many people you're going to need to keep the cleanup and so forth. I just want to make sure because that's what we typically do when we go through that process of applying for. Yes, permits. absolutely. So. so we would want to work very closely with the, the Bradenton Police Department as we do with the Sarasota Police Department and the Northport City Police Department um, to, to really get their input on it as well. It has worked out pretty well with um, on a daily basis with just having one off-duty police officer but then when we have our grand opening celebration that's when we hire more um, and, and that's when we also make sure that they have a vehicle present things like that um, but fortunately we haven't had any any issues we did have um, vandalism that you might have read about in Sarasota um, one of the banners in the beginning of the exhibition um, but it was just that one piece and and that was it was quickly resolved fortunately we were able to get that back up um, very quickly and, and worked really closely with the chief of police in Sarasota um, and and so that was all that happened we didn't have anything else happen throughout the remainder of the exhibition there and and so far um, Northport has been going really well um, has been very well received so we would we would definitely want to work closely with the police but, but they don't know about it at at this time right they do know that we are hoping that we are coming forward for this um, and that we are hoping to have it there but no we haven't started those conversations about the specifics yet because that you know we I like to know if they've had an idea to scope the place and, and all of that I'm, I'm just absolutely. thinking of safety no oh, absolutely we we care about the safety especially of our students on their field trips that's that's really our prime concern oh I know you care I just want to yes make sure it's been worked out I am um, I, I appreciate uh, my fellow board members concerns um, and it's new to us certainly this is a new request that we're getting but I would just like to point out that this is not new to them. They've been doing it for 20 years. I, I have a, an element of confidence. I'm familiar with previous years um, installations and I visited them and I've enjoyed them. And I would venture a guess that this not being her first rodeo, she is going to be able to come to the table with an element of understanding of what we need and don't need. To the extent that we would like more comfort with that, I believe that, that we are probably, gonna, defer to Mr. Rudisil within our bounds to make any approval contingent upon if we desired asking the city event committee to go through their process so that we had an, ele uh, an element of comfort and I imagine that 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 would be a process that sh that Ms. Wertheimer would be familiar with. I also imagine that the agreement ultimately that we would ask Mr. Rudisil to review would be one that we could get 
comfortable with as far as the liability and and safety concerns. I'll just note that what I'm seeing and hearing is valid concerns, but also a community that has unequivocally asked us to do something. Um, and and that, to that extent, my thought is I'd like to try. I'd like to try to accommodate the request from that community. Um, and so if with some guidance and further conversation, I, that's, that's what I'm looking at. I think that everything you raise is valid, but not insurmountable. Again, I I want to double check. I've I've actually um, tried to get information on the scope and time frame of that project. Is it going to turn on 13th at some point? And I mean, I just I can't remember right now when it was brought in front of us and we looked at. It. I mean, it's it's been it was prob it was over a year ago that it was brought in front of the city council. So I just am, want to make sure that that if this goes forward that we're not setting up hurdles or difficulty or having people walk through a construction site to get there i'm very concerned about that i mean unintended consequences i mean i know of a situation where you had uh, someone illegally parking on property that they did not own it was owned by another government entity she fell twisted her ankle and now she's suing them and they're probably going to have to settle with her, even though she did not have permission to park on that property. And I'm also reminded of the situation over in Palmetto, where there was raw property that the city owned that they did not fence off, and people started parking on it without permission, mm -hmm. and then it became a huge issue. It was property that they assembled to do a development project with, and they had people from hither and yon, many that didn't even live in the city of Palmetto, don't pay city of Palmetto taxes, coming up and complaining to them. So I think that, number one, um, this is what's in front of us today. I don't have enough information to be able to feel comfortable making a decision. And I, I don't want, as I used to say to my kids, I need more information if you, if you keep pushing me now you're getting a fast no I get more information you might get a slow yes so I, I if I could just say um, with respect to the liability and the insurance um, so that we did work with the risk department um, with the city so they were comfortable with the insurance that we provided them um, that that was so I do believe that in the example that you just said that that would actually be on us um, but I also don't think insurance. that anybody thought about the fact that there's a ongoing construction road project right there that and again you try to set up things as safely as possible, but people are going to do what people are going to do, and they're going to they're gonna, still going to go through there. To that point, though, Mr. McClellan was was involved in the. Conversation. I think Mr. McClellan was involved in the discussion of what could happen at that site. I don't know that we tend to have a problem now with not putting all of the pieces together, and it's going to come down on us. If we don't, this has got, we've got to know that people can get there safely. If we're going to, if we're going to put what could be considered an attractive nuisance, that's what the legal term is. I'm not calling this exhibit a nuisance, but if you set up something that attracts people and they can't get there safely, then you've caused your own problem. Again, I'm not trying to stop anything. I just need more information. I, I wish I had the answers for you on that particular project. Well, my question is, and I'm trying to. We need them. Are you time certain on? So your start date would be the 29th of April. What was your end date going to? Uh, be? May 29th. And are you already locked in at other municipalities or counties? To, no. No. It, is... If if we had to delay to get some of these questions answered, would, how, how would that affect? The only concern is, is we really try not to go into June because of hurricane season. And, um, and the, the banners are anchored into the ground four feet under. They are very secure in all kinds of weather, but not in a hurricane. Um, and so that is where we do try not to go past um, the end of May. Thank you. How much time would you need to, to get it all assembled? Like if you want to do it the end of April, how long is the process of getting it 
So the actual installation happens in one day, um, eight to five. We are done. It's a crew of about 10 to 12 people who, who erects the exhibit. Um, however, the, the reason that we would hope to get this approved today is really for marketing purposes so that we can get the word out there and, and make sure that we're promoting this um, in a way that does bring people to, to Bradenton and to the Village of the Arts. For your grand opening, what would your hours of all the ceremonies and everything be? It would be from 12 to 3 is what we've done at the other locations. Um, and, and we would love to have live music and, and fun activities. Um, we've had arts and cultural organizations who we partner with who have tables there um, with, with fun activities for kids and families of all ages. Um, in this area, we would love to work with the Village of the Arts and with those galleries for them to be able to, to have some fun activities and, and different things to incentivize people to go into their shops as well. As a point of order, that day is the same day as the DeSoto Parade. That's what just hit me. Just and okay. all, all of I mean, it would be difficult. We could look at Sunday. It's not fully set in stone. Um, yeah. This is we why could. you go through that. That's process. why you go through Sunday. the process because, um, and I, I don't know if Officer Pallant wants to speak to the fact that when we have. The DeSoto Parade, it's all hands on deck, and... I can speak to that. <laughs> well, I was trying to... I Yeah. yeah let's not hide what I used to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would require all officers at the parade, but probably not till about 4. Um, the concern would be Mancy Avenue gets shut down at 1st Street, and then Mancy Avenue... Well, it gets shut down at 1st Street about 5, um, and then all of Mancy gets shut down for the night so any people we're flexible who to go to the 30th to go to sunday just just want to make sure that, we're on that, that might be a better choice just okay. because it that day is crazy oh absolutely we don't want to conflict with another event a lot of people come to town but at the same time they're not coming yeah. to see you yes <laughs> absolutely oh mr chairman we do have a regular city council meeting on april the 12th yes. that we could have a CRA a special CRA meeting to discuss this again I just feel like I can't I can't vote yes for this with all of these questions that I have and it's and I know, I know that it is not you know you you think of you think about your event but we have to think about the entire city absolutely uh, mr. Perry's back I believe do you have some information sir sure. thank you yeah, see that's Rob Perry, I'm the city administrator. I just got off the phone with Public Works. I kind of stepped in, heard a little bit about uh, the proposal and, and the use of the, the city CRA property. Um, Public Works currently has the project for sidewalk and street repair um, that is ungraded and it's really in a milled condition right now. We're hopeful to get that completed sometime within the next month, basically. Um, a lot of the underground work has been done. However, there's also additional work on a cooperative project with the state that is um, in the general area south with some d d uh, flow d design for stormwater runoff. Maybe if you've been down there, as I was about a week ago, you've seen some of the different um, stormwater improvements they put into the curb and gutter and the like and the connectivity of the conveyances and the like. Those are dynamic projects right now because of the uh, availability of labor and we subcontract them out with, with various types of road and underground contractors. And when they have the labor and they have the materials available um, is when we get in there and do different components related to construction, critical path, ultimately completion. It's a somewhat dynamic uh, environment we're in right now. I think it would be advisable um, to probably very carefully coordinate this event with some of the activities that are occurring down in the Village of the Arts because there's been a, a couple of different um, uh, concerns raised. One is obviously the condition of the roadways, the sidewalks, the pedestrian um, areas and the like. And then secondly, in talking with Public Works, apparently they were contacted with, by CRA and asked, could you grade the, the two acre site, basically the parcel itself? Well, that's nice to grade it. And that sounds like something that would be asked by a user agency. But from a liability perspective, um, you also have responsibility for top uh, uh, topography and and pedestrian traffic engineering to make sure it is a st safe site when you talk about some of the events uh, locations where the event was held Bendison Park and the like believe it or not at some point in time a traffic engineer a pedestrian traffic engineer looked at that and basically certified it 
acceptable site to assemble people in a pedestrian use um, uh, purpose with attendant uh, uh, traffic routes for emergency access equipment if someone gets hurt, fire trucks, rescue wagons, things like that, and a whole host of other issues. I probably suggest that if you really want to do a thorough job that it be referred back to the special events and get those folks that address them to look at this carefully. Um, when I heard about school buses coming in and things like that, it didn't sound like your typical Friday night uh, art walk. And so with that being said, that's kind of the posture of where the adjunct city projects and, and departments are as it relates to the proximity and, and location. Thank you, sir. Mr. Perry, do you by chance know when the pavilion will be the forever grass or whatever is going down, when that will be uh, completed? Yes, ma'am. Um, the latest report we have on that is it's about a two-month process. If you've been by there, as I have a couple times this week, they have uh, done the, a lot of the demolition thus far. Um, but it's a, a fairly lengthy process that needs a, 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 a base course and then a whole host of other things along the critical path to construction. I was thinking to put in artificial turf was maybe a two or three week process. Yeah. I'm told it's six to eight weeks that they'll be down at Rossi Park. Um, yeah. If I may. Yes, ma'am. Um, to the extent that it would make us more comfortable to go through the events, uh, special events process, I, I think that that's fine. Um, I would suggest that we meet earlier than the 12th yeah. because of the advertising um, issues that Ms. Swarthheimer has raised. When is the when is the next date for the event committee to get together? Though I don't know. Farmer said next week. Next week it's on the Thursday, whatever next Thursday. Is. So that would be April the sixth. Depends. Yes, yes. And I didn't hear when the event was, and I apologize. I came in late. April I should have known. Twenty sixth of April, I'm assuming. Twenty ninth. Well, right. and I think I'd like to be clear who's making application. Whose event is this? Who's all that? I, I, it, 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 yeah. It's obviously, when I was told that risk management said that they were comfortable with it, I'd like to look at the coverage because I can't imagine that if you have an unimproved. May I have a podium? Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. Um, if you have an unproved piece of property, and, and I've been through that property, you know, many times, and they de they demolished two structures out of the property. There was other um, uh, opportunities and, and, and the surface things that they did to the property. And I don't think you just, you know, get your John Deere and, and, and blade the property and you're good to put two, three hundred people there. There comes a lot of issues with that type of thing and responsibilities. We're a landowner. And I don't know what the coverage is. I don't know if the insurer knows it because you could get denied coverage. And I don't know if there's any excess carrier or the like. So I'd, I'd want to look at those things from a, a litigation perspective and have Mr. Rudisell do the same, frankly, to make sure if we're going to allow people to, to traverse an unimproved area, that we understand that we're indemnified, we're insured, and any other legal um, uh, concerns are addressed. I just, it's kind of weird allowing people to just come on an unimproved site and have a public event there for a period of time that's somewhat sponsored by the CRA. Be a pretty good case to take to court for premise liability. May I? Um, it's, it is not sponsored, is my understanding. We're not actually sponsoring the event. We are giving permission to use property. And again, I think we're kind of spinning our wheels. We all agree that there's unanswered questions. My point, though, is none of them are insurmountable. If we wanted to do the investigation, I believe that we could commit to it and do it. And my point is, is that a community has expressed a desire for us to do so. What community? See, that's what I'm saying. Village of the who's Arts. Making the, okay, well, who's making the application? Because I'm hearing different things. Is it the Art Guild? Is it the Village of the Arts? I is it embracing our differences? I think it's embracing our differences with the support of the community, Village of the Arts, in which it will be installed. That's, that's what I'm that's hearing. That's what you're hearing. <laughs> We I, that's what I want. I want to know who's making the application, who's signing off on it, and I feel like it's got to go through that pro that right process. I think we. I, but I, to I, I'm point, not saying anything differently. Yes, yeah, so we we agree. It's going to need to go through that process. Okay, well, just, she's making a representation that it can just be done. She's seeing everything being over, but no, I don't understand no, that. I don't, I don't believe that. I <laughs> yeah. What this the statement was is that these are hurdles that. Potentially can be jumped. However, time frame wise, that may not work out for your time frame and hurricane season. That's that's the only issue. Um, so, 
Any further discussion to put something forward to, or okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Russo, go ahead. The only other thing I want to add, as I mentioned before, we do need to have an agreement with the entity related to what they're doing on the site and how these issues are going to be addressed. So when we're looking at time frames, we also need time to have an agreement to put in front of this board as well. Now, it sounds like they've they've already done this a couple times and even with some public entities, so they, you know, they might have uh, something that we can at least use to start working on that, um, but that needs to be part of the equation as well. It was on our river walk. I mean, Sorry. it was on the river walk. And I'm try and I don't know who brought the event to us. I think it was Realize Bradenton. So it, I, yeah, it was it was embracing our differences, working with Realize Bradenton. But it was us still um, the exact same way that we're funding everything. We're we're doing everything. We dealt with still all of the insurance um, and everything else in the agreement. And and it always has been on city. So all of our agreements have always been um, with public entities. Mm -hmm. May I, Miss Wertheimer, have you have you discussed this with anyone else in? The city of Bradenton, as far as any other partnerships, or are you? Would you venture a guess to say that if this doesn't happen, it's not happening? Correct, because we we were hoping to go to Riverwalk um, as we had been there 2013 through 2015, um, but because of the turf, uh, that that is no longer an option. Um, so yes, this really is the the only other area that that could work um, and that could be central for the community and for the schools as well. I'll, again, I'll just say my point is not that I'm I'm just trying to throw it together. I'm saying they've been doing it for 20 years. I think they have a familiarity with all of our concerns and addressing them. A community has asked us to consider it, and I think that we could consider it if we chose to do so. But Council Member Moore, there's there's I, I have nothing in front of me oh, then other I, then than I, 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 I mean, make a motion then because I would move that we require them to go through the process and consider having a special meeting to discuss it. I'd second that. Motion to second any discussion. Well, now, wait a minute. So you're moving to approve it as long as they go no, through I'm, that? I'm approving. I'm, I am approving. I'm making a motion that we direct them to go through the process and uh, bring to us the special events process for consideration at a special meeting. And all those questions will be be answered they better be answered because like be, I said I, I can't I can't in good conscience say yes now and well, I, I the, wouldn't say yes to just this I, I, you have raised good points we I, I yeah. we know that they're going to be in the very I, least I she's going to have a contract <laughs> I need to see a site plan I need to see where all of the artwork is going I need to know where the portalettes are going to be are they going to be secured each night um, what is how many officers do you anticipate needing is that going to be approved by the department because will they have people that they can just off-duty officers for that because sometimes between vacations and things like that it just it just we just can't wave a magic wand and make people work so again there's a lot that goes into getting approval from a from a city government and and you're familiar with that um again i'm concerned about the 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 nature of the property we we've not had a, we've had discussions about buying it and what could happen there and we asked for feedback from the village but we have not gone forward with that and if we are going to go forward and have it be used as some kind of a event space then we need to take the responsibility of setting it up to do that and if people are people are showing up and parking on that lot right now during art walks and that it is again raw land and someone stumbles there's there's no lighting on it somebody stumbles and gets hurt we're going to have to absorb the liability of that so again but she's indemnified i've participated i have participated in this when it started the very first year i participated with this i'm not opposed to this i am opposed to opening up all the city taxpayers to liability 
I don't think we're doing that if they're indemnifying us. But also, I will just say, but I'm not I don't saying have, you have proof to prove of that, Miss Moore. But if and we you go don't have to process, do it today, I'm so sorry. If we go through the application process, all those questions will be answered, and it'll either be approved or denied. Okay. If those answers aren't squared away, that's what the process would do. Yes. Are we going to take a vote? No, no, no. Clear, I mean, yes, I. The motion is to direct them to go through the event review process. For embracing our differences to proceed, if they intend to pursue the request to proceed with these special events um, application in a timely fashion for their time, and as well as we hope to make this meeting uh, that they're allegedly having next week. And then it would be. Um, we would have to meet earlier. We would have to have a special meeting earlier than the 12th is what I'm hearing because of the advertising and marketing aspect of what they do. Ms. Russo, do we as the city CRA board have the authority to direct city to put this group through that committee, that event review committee, or do we have to take the event review committee form and write out white out city of Bradenton put on their CRA and then have it done that way well I think e either way I think it sounds like the intent is that the event would be reviewed by that group and they would give their input as they would on any other special event on city property is that what's it's an opinion right. right even if it's not an official um, city permit being requested, they would go through the same process. So I think that's fine to, you know, to ask for that from the CRA board. Yeah. And just allow me to say this because of my schedule, I can do it on the 12th. There's, there's a lot Mr. to go through. Just one further point on the yes, insurance and, and what Councilor Moore was referring to in the indemnification. Um, Generally speaking, when we get when we require insurance, we get a blanket letter of coverage. It's a deck page, basically a declaration page. When the point is made that this event has been done for many years in many locations, that's all fine. I think I would have asked, has it ever been done on unimproved, recently demolished property? That's probably a more poignant, important question, because I think an insurance company may have a different look on that. From a practical perspective, and I'm not the city attorney, although I, I am a lawyer, Mr. Rudisell would be the person to talk to, I think we have to be ensured that the insurance company is going to provide coverage for the conditions that are existent to the property. Because that way, if they deny coverage, we're not out in the cold with a, with a certificate of insurance that has an exclusion. If there's any modifications to the property, if the property is in substandard condition, if the property has unusual contours and things like that, that that would be excluded language. And so it's ne never quite as simple as it sounds, is my point. The one thing that gleams out to me from this is that the, the insurance coverage would have to include the condition of the property. And that's gonna be a unique situation that the insurer sure. Mm -hmm. for for uh, embrace our differences and 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 the organization would have to work out they can do it I think it is doable there's insurance companies that provide that but I would want, want to make sure that the scope of the policy and the coverage uh, addresses the condition of the property I, I don't think we're in a disagreement about that yeah, sure. I, I think the process would speak to that I think it would bear it to mind right. then I think that on that and, and you don't have to do a, an amendment but I but I think it's important that uh, that those insurance documents and the insurance uh, the policy itself, the declaration page, the coverages page, just be submitted to the city so that Mr. Rudisoff can look at that to so view you all an opinion. Would this be covered? Would this not be covered? Because again, it's very unique to the extent mm -hmm. of the condition of the property. I can't stress that enough. It's really not designed to have events right now. But we could have events, I mean, you can have events probably in a lot of different places. But you have to be mindful of the premise liability associated with it. Thank you, sir. And if you want to come back up. So you heard what Mr. Perry had to say. Obviously, those are, we're giving you a lot of criteria, but it's, the idea is if we are eventually going to vote to approve this at whatever next meeting it is, um, all these check boxes are going to be met. 
Yes. So, and I think we all shame on us for probably assuming that we were going to have something like this already done today to be able to, you know, everybody came and gave their support, which was fantastic, but they might have waited till the next meeting and you might have had more people. But um, there was a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Any clarification on it? We, we know what we're voting on? I believe so. Okay. I'll start with you, Ms. Moore. I, I, uh, yes. 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 Thank All right. You. Passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Uh, Appreciate Katarina you. will be in close car, GG, probably close contact with you here shortly. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now on to the central CRA portion of the agenda. Resolution CRA 2302, appoint Kimwell Morrell to the CCRA Advisory Board. Mr. Chair, CRA Board, um, I, don't, I don't see Ms. Morrell in the audience, but um, the process, so she was recommended by a current CCRA Advisory Board. So we reached out to her. She's a resident of the CCRA. She also has a... The CCRA or the... Her... Or her her program is in the 14th Street CRA, but she's a resident of the CCRA. So she meets the criteria of the bylaws and the legibility for the board. Uh, she's been very active, very passionate. Um, so before you have a resolution and a little bit of a bio that she has provided for your consideration. We do have an empty spot that's been open since the beginning of the board for a year and a half now. And um, when we brought it to them, would you like us to advertise it? Or do you know somebody that you'd like us to reach out to see if they're interested? That's when that recommendation came forward and she has accepted she, she would like to be part of the board. Fantastic. So this recommendation is coming from the central CRA? Yeah. It came from one member. It didn't okay. come from the whole group, but it was a recommendation from one of their members, yes. One? From one? From one? And the other? They, just they didn't meet, in t like, when she came and said yes, it was after their meeting, so we didn't have time to take it back. But it was recommended to me. I was approached and say, hey, she would be a good candidate. Why don't you reach out to her? Who was the board member? Uh, Ms. Sharon Rolls. Well, she knows where she lives in, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> I wouldn't share her address. Okay. So what do you need, a motion? I need a motion to approve. Resolution CRA 2302. No, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're into building CRA advisory boards right now. Go for it. <laughs> well, okay. I, I guess I hope you're in. I move to approve. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> There's a motion. Second. A second. Any further discussion? All right. Take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, passes 5-0. Uh, update from the CCRA advisory board meeting. Hello, board members. Chris Mignon, CRA manager. Uh, so on February 23rd, there were two items that were um, directed for staff to talk to the uh, CCRA advisory board about and on March 15th we had a meeting um, chairman Kramer was in attendance at that meeting so um, thank you for being uh, sure. being there um, so the two I things the have any pizza <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it was a good meeting um, so basically I'll, I'll kind of keep it short so the first thing was the mini Lee Rogers tenant um, and the yeah, they brought forth, uh, Mr. Giodadio had brought forth that it could be a Dollar Tree, a family dollar, a combo of the two, or what it was. So we, I brought that to their attention, and I explained to them what had happened at the meeting, and um, asked their uh, opinion about it. And so during discussion, um, you know, they were, uh, they were basically looking at, um, 
that they would support it. So they made a motion, and I'll read that motion, that Board Member Byrd made the motion that whether or not the store is a combination or one or the other, the board will support it. The caveat was they would like and they would prefer that it would be a layout that would be more conducive to have a grocer, more groceries in it. So I think that's more of a family dollar, but I know they're kind of doing a combo or uh, of a couple of family dollar, dollar tree or things like that. But they would like to see that kind of um, layout um, and that motion passed unanimous, unanimously uh, six to zero. Oh. And so that was the, the one thing that you guys had directed. The other one is the, the property on uh, 6th Street East that was pulled from the um, intent to dispose um, in regards to research on maybe a community center or service center or something like that would be more appropriate. Uh, I talked to them about it. They voiced concerns as zoning, parking, safety of kids, uh, things like that. So basically they made a motion, Mr. Bird had made the motion to continue with the original plan of long-term owner occupied property. So they weren't in favor of that space becoming some sort of services kind of thing. That was their opinion on it. And that also passed six zero. And if I could interrupt there, they were vocally, vocally not in favor of that. They, it was sort of a, some had already, they, in their opinion, sort of not worked. And uh, so. Well, that's, I like hearing what they have yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, that weighs very heavily. Let them know that thank you, because I do like to hear that. Yeah, it's one of the reasons, I mean, I think strongly encourage us to create that rotation where we all attend them. It's very beneficial. And, uh, mm -hmm. Then that way we can come back and talk at this meeting about mm -hmm. what we heard. We make sure we sell it to some, it's sold to someone without children. <laughs> <laughs> so those were the motions that uh, they passed and that was the direction by the board to get those opinions. And that that's my update on that meeting. Can you thank them? Because I know they're volunteers. Mm -hmm. They're taken away from their time, and it does weigh. I mean, their opinion. I am glad to hear it. So, I just want to thank I them. I would definitely convey that. Thank it's you. not thank the you. first time they've been clear about their. Yeah, they're smart. It they helps really us to are. make our decisions they up really here. Are a good advisory board. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is tenant approval for Mini Rogers site, Mr. Peter Diadio. Hello, CRA board. Hello, sir. Peter Diadio from 1101 Third Street East, I'm the developer of our Mini Roger site. Thank you very much for taking the time to hear me today. Um, before I, I, I'm going to keep it short, but before I, I wanted to just bring to your attention, and I know you already know this, but Katarina and her team, I witnessed the, her last year's achievements, and they're, they're terrific. And they've helped me on the Mini Roger site move this process along. So I know they must have done the same for the other accomplishments. So we're really glad to have them, and uh, I appreciate you know their input. And I wanted to just bring it up because um, I think it's important. Also, part of their efforts, we heard just from Chris regarding that neighborhood input that I'm sure it's going to help you on the vote for the the uh, that we're going to ask for today on the. Um, on the Dollar Tree, which is owned by Family Dollar. No, just okay. sitting forward. So anyways, um, so since our last report, I wanted to let you know that what we have been doing, because if you, you notice the last time we were here with the, with the plans that were mu had a much more reduced site with the stormwater management and the different things that we've been going through, there's a, a couple things that we've been doing that I just wanted to bring to your attention. So the first item, I, I you have a, a report um, for you, you can read more later. But the first concern, or not, maybe not the first, but the first one I'll speak about is the availability of water. Um, uh, the water and by the gallons for reasons of both potable water and also for fire protection. 
and when we f initially started our, our project, the closest fire plug to us was on the west side of uh, the CSSX line, the rail line, which is fire plug 402. And we tested that, 2,900 gallons, a lot of water, but there was a concern about crossing the CSX, and so we were advised to go down to 12th, which we did. We went down to 12th, designed in that method, but there's no water there. Well, there's water. There's 8,900 gallons in the fire plug that we were asked to go to, which is part of the design problem. Our fire trucks need 1,000. So we've tested other plugs there as well. They're marginal in the 1,000 range. And when you take a big look at the area all around this neighborhood, except this neighborhood, 2,900, 2,900, 2,900, but our neighborhood, that the, the, there's no fire plugs close and they're, they don't have adequate water. So we redid the design and we did the design. Fortunately, the city of Bradenton, um, uh, Jim and Tim let us know that there's an old sleeve that goes under the rail tracks that it's like 48 inches wide. It has a 36 inch abandoned sanitation line that goes through it, no longer being used. So we have a path to bring that water down 13th. So, so we can tap into that 2900 line. We have the GPS out there, ground uh, penetrating radar. We've discovered all these things, more survey and so forth. So we think we're gonna end up with a solution to bring this water down 13th. And what it can do is two things. One thing, it can give us the water we need for fire protection and potable water for our shopping center, but it also is gonna allow the city to to fortify that neighborhood that doesn't have enough water because it really doesn't. And, and I think that the city, you know, you'll do your city work and so forth to, to realize that. And uh, so that would, we hope to be our, our solution. It, it can satisfy those two, those two needs, the neighborhood and, uh, and us. The second item that we've been working on is this compensated storage, the 100 year flood. And so the 100 year flood, of course we have to redesign our whole project. I'm gonna show you a quick map on it now where our building became smaller but the 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 flood of course there's no fema floodplain that we spoke about last time it's not on this site but yet there was a study done in i think 2017 that says the affluent line <clears throat> overflows and the floodplain really it's this deep it's from 16.5 to 17.19 eight inches but yet that volume needs to be compensated for so we think we have a plan. What we've also done is we've dug up that city line with a, a, a vacuum truck and found exactly where it is in three locations on that site. Because the survey says it's 36 inches below grade, but it's not. It's 42 inches below grade. We've marked it. It'll be resurveyed. We have it resurveyed. We're waiting for the report. That six inches, if we can excavate, we will find the spot for this water once every 100 years. And it's just that, I mean, we could drive across it. You know, it's not that deep. And if we allow the water to go into our parking lot, I think we can overcome it. Because the problem we're having with the plans that our engineers have redone to send to our tenant is it takes away parking, takes away building, takes away drive lanes. And so now our tenants doesn't like the plan anymore. So we've done a couple of reiterations. I'll share with you quickly what they are. But I think we have the solution. And that solution, um, uh, I expect to be ready in the next week or so, so we can timely get our SIP approval by our allowable date by the end of April. Uh, the third item is the effluent line. <clears throat> and that effluent line, that 3.5 gallons per second that we've been held to, the city is allowing us, I'm down on number three, uh, the city has allowed us to increase that amount by some engineering calculations. It's not where we want it to be, but we think it's where it can be to allow us to fix the stormwater management um, issue. And uh, we've already sent a plan to McDonald's that likes it. We need to modify the plan and bring it to Family Dollar. We hope to have that ready in the next few weeks or in the next few days so we can send a uh, a new SIP into the city for their approval so we can um, end up with our approval of the SIP in the appropriate time. So additional engineering and additional survey work that we've been doing over the last 30 or 60 days has been a lot. We got to redesign the whole project, but I'll just quickly share them with you. This is not the approved plan, but this is the plan that McDonald's likes. Can you see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a little bit different has this line coming all the way around it. 
not to get into the nitty gritty of it because that would take a long time. This is the plan that my engineers thinks works, which is a little bit different, but the important thing is you see they made this building smaller. So I have a smaller building. And this is the new design of the building if it was this size. There's the floor plan, which has fewer stores and the family dollar. The building looks similar. It's just smaller, 17,000 feet instead of 20,000 feet. That's the front, dollar store's front door removed. Sandwich stop still on the corner. And this is where the other shops would go along the side. So that's what we've been doing. Um, we still have continued to market the property for lease, uh, hopefully for additional tenants. And we do have some strong interest, actually, from a private school that's like a magnet school type of use. And they've had two levels of approvals. I'm not ready to ask for uh, a tenant approval yet because I'm not that far along. They need, they need two more steps of approval before we get a letter of intent and before we can move anything along in that regard. But uh, I just wanted to let you know there's that level of interest. It's a, it's a larger use, 15,000, 17,000 square foot use. Could fit great in the neighborhood. They love the neighborhood for their, at least this is the level of information that I've got from their, anal their analysis and their real estate director. So I need to get one more step from them to say, yes, okay, we'll provide you a letter of proposal, which I don't have yet. So- Excuse me, can I, can I stop you, that's okay. Please. You said a private school? A private school, like a magnet school type of use. Yeah, but a tax you paying- a charter? A tax allowed to I'm sorry? What? <laughs> Are we allowed to know who, is there any- Well, I don't have that information yet, but I will. I'll provide it all if they, if I you make it to the, the next name step. Of it? All I have right now is the private school because, the, uh, well, I can tell you who, provided me the information, M-O-H-R. The guy's name is Drew um, So is it a charter, Engel. see there's a difference between a charter school, a magnet school, a private school, they're all different. They are different, uh, 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 Councilman Barnaby, and I don't have that clarification yet. They're okay. not, they're not uh, allowing me to know that yet. Okay. But I will know it, and I, and I won't ask for this approval until we have all those, all those questions answered. Right now they're not answered to me, but the level of interest is strong enough so that I want to at least bring it, bring it up. I'm and curious if the board is interested in it. In what, it, so in what footprint? I'm sorry? In what footprint are we talking about? Well, it, it's between 15 and 17,000. So, so that'll mean everything ought to be redrawn? Show the map up again of that, yeah. the site plan, I guess. Not the, not the full one, but of where it had family dollar on one side and the four roads on the other. Yeah, so it, it would be the <clears> entire <throat> building. So instead of a family dollar or, or right. I, oh, just, what? I think we want no part of that, in fairness. <laughs> Say it again? I think we want no part of that. I think the community wants no part of that. Yeah, I, I think, well, the, I, I know, I'm sure they do. And I, I, if once I get more information, then I'll be able to request that. I right thought now, we it's just, just got level approval of for family dollar from the C central CRA, and I thought that's what we were doing today. Everything we've well, talked, I mean, hold on a second. At any point, and you, and you, and you can tell me, and you can tell me, <laughs> has there ever been anything, any talk about any type of school going in this property? No. Not to no, my knowledge. there is not. It is supposed to be the McDonald's, and then retail. some type of retail facility. And that is fine with me. I mean, I'm the developer. We're working with you to get built what you want built. So I'm not trying to change our mind. I'm not trying to say, hey, listen, you want to look at this other use, but I'm letting you know there's another use interested. Okay. And I wouldn't bring it and ask for a, a use or request yet because it's early. If they move along and you think that's a good idea, we'll proceed. If you don't, we'll just tell them, I'm sorry, the CRA w will not allow it and that will be good enough. Am I able to but anyways, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't have brought it up, but I, I, I believe <laughs> it's my job to. Maybe you shouldn't I, because I, you don't have enough information well, to tell us. Right, I, tell us the name of the school. I believe, I believe it's my job to because okay. they're, you know, I'm marketing, they're inquiring, and I'm letting you know about the inquiry. But what I'm really here for is the vote for the Dollar Tree. Well, I think that's part of my concern is that we, I mean, 
it's always being redrawn, redrawn, redrawn for different tenants. At some point, we just got to, I mean, if we have Dollar Tree ready and it's, and you're redrawn for that, <laughs> I, I, I feel like we just keep spinning in the mud because it keeps changing. And part, some of that, I don't know, I, I, I feel like, and, and the stuff about the utilities and everything, I thought we were just talking about Family Tree and Dollar Tree today. That's we don't have public works here to discuss all this stuff. I, I mean, I, 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 that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Next is okay. Mrs. I just Moore. have to clarify. So the we are uh, two things that I would like clarification. Um, did you say that you got some kind of comfort from the dollar or the family dollar corporation that it was going to either be a family dollar or a hybrid, or is still a Dollar no, Tree? No, uh, here's what the fa I've got real estate committee approval from Family Dollar. Okay, and Family Dollar and Dollar Tree is the same company. Right. And and Ben Keelstone, who is the real estate director and who has secured that approval for us, has instructed me that it could be a Dollar Tree or a combination store. Now they didn't say that it would never be a Family Dollar because it's up to them who they put that in. And when I brought that up a few weeks ago. There was a concern, well, hold it. We approved a family dollar right. and not a Dollar Tree. So that's what this meeting's about. Um, I'm, I only added my report because I'm required to give you a report every 30 days of what I'm doing. Okay. And then, and then another, um, just to clarify, um, the school would, then we would not have any kind of dollar. I don't really have a proposal from the school. No, 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 I know, I know. I just wanted to make sure I understood what, yeah. what you were, yeah. what the report right. was. If, if the school decides to make a proposal, mm -hmm. I'd bring it to the, to the board. And if they said, no, they don't want the school, we'd chase it away. If they said, yes, we like the school, it would take up both spaces. And then if I could also just clarify, but the, but the, board, the advisory board just said they would like they were okay with any of it, right? We we did not know about this information. Um, this report was just emailed last night, okay, and so, so we uh, and we so we didn't even have that information to present to them. The only information that was presented is it has been approved as a family dollar. Given that the Dollar Tree has bought Family Dollar, if there is a Dollar Tree or a Family Dollar or a combination, yeah. would and they're comfortable with any of those three, okay. that their preference would be the Family Dollar if they had a say, but they're okay with all three. That's their recommendation back. Yeah, and, and that's the only and, thing I'm asking for here. And, I'm, and not, I'm not asking for the school because I don't even know that we have. Right, right. Well, well, I'm going to ask you this: You were at the advisory board meeting when they. Yes. approved either family dollar or dollar tree but yet you still entertained a school i mean well so um uh councilman um councilwoman yeah, councilwoman uh um, coachman uh when we're marketing uh commercial real estate you know we um take information from all parties that are interested. okay stop right there i understand that but you come to us looking for approval and then you kind of throw in this private school. Yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to sneak anything in. I'm reporting. Uh, I'm reporting what, what we've done since the last report. And what we've done is continue to market the property as, which is our job. And we've continued to verify these utilities and these um, uh, other um, uh, challenges with the site, with the floodplain, that we've we never expected. but they're in front of us. So we're dealing with all these items and Understood. I'm not trying to sell one way or another, I'm informing. And so it's obviously with the feedback that I've received, <laughs> you may not, never want me to bring a school in if they're interested. That, that might've been something you would have started with to well, ask if, you know, you've, been, you, you've had this, you know, uh, uh, school that says, hey, I saw your, your ad and I'm, I'm you know, well, I, I want to throw my hat hat in, you know, in there. But then you presented it to us as not as an ask or what you guys think about this. It was like, this is who I'm talking to and and I'll get more information. And well, that's I, I thought I did that. I apologize. No, you did. If I did. You, yeah. yeah, I apologize <laughs> if I did. We, we, we got intra interest from two levels and there's more to come. I'm not sure I'm going to get a proposal. I got you. Yeah. You, you know, we, we just, yeah. I, I apologize if I said it incorrectly. My, my error. 
So anyways, what we're really here for is to vote for the Dollar Tree. I really need that to move the project along, um, and I'm hoping that, uh, that we can get that today, if possible. I, I don't love a Dollar Tree. I wish that we could just have confirmation from the Family Dollar Corporation that they would give us the hybrid or the Family Dollar, but if the, I mean, I'm going to probably uh, defer to the advisory board and, and chairman, since you were able to witness the advisory board, consider it. Um, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, there, I mean, and Chris can speak to this. There were concerns i think over really the grocery aspect of family dollar versus dollar tree yet there are apparently dollar trees that have a pretty robust frozen food section for a dollar 25 per item so that was of great interest to them but chris you can speak specifically to if you like i mean it's i'll just add a couple of things that they had said and that's to the chairman's point is that during the discussion they like how their family dollar has more of a grocer aspect to it but also they had a concern because family dollars pricing is a little bit different than dollar tree's pricing dollar tree's pricing i think she it's uh everything's a dollar 25 a dollar 25 or whatever it is family dollar it can range yeah. you know from this to that so there was concerns on both sides of things but ultimately you know they feel it's a need in the community and they'll support whatever comes in but they would like to have that grocery component if that's something that we could do i just think there's such a history yeah. of trying to get something there that either one uh, i'm in favor of yeah yeah agreed. all right so who wants to put forth a motion Oh, Pam, it's your. <laughs> I move that we approve the Family Dollar Corporation as a proposed tenant for. Do I have to get more specific as far as square footage and whatnot? I don't think so. I don't know. Katarina, do you? No, she says. Um, I think we're just approving the tenants. Okay. I would, I would probably, I mean, Mr. Rudisil, I would probably list all the three options, the dollar tree, okay. the family dollar, or the combination uh, okay. option. I move that we approve the family dollar corporation as a tenant for, in order of preference, a, high, a family dollar, a hybrid store, or a dollar tree. I, if I, oh. it's a Dollar Tree, in, in, it's actually the Dollar oh, Tree okay. instead of the Family Dollar Thank Corporation. You. I Okay, so the family, I'm sorry, the Dollar Tree, I approve, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry. I approve, <laughs> Me too, that's why I threw it. I approve the Dollar Tree Corporation as a proposed tenant for uh, uh, the use of, in order of my preference, the family dollar, a hybrid store, or the Dollar Tree? Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, vote to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate your consideration, and I'm sure I'll see you here uh, next month. Thank you. <laughs> don't forget bat we're time, same bat channel, Mr. Diadio. <laughs> don't forget we're a city council, not a town council. <laughs> right now we're CRA board. Uh, update on notices of intent to dispose CRA owned properties, please. I know you're all hungry. So make it quick. <laughs> so basically, um, we posted the notice to this of disposition in the Bradenton Herald uh, on March 2nd. Um, we have 30 days from then to be able to engage in negotiations or offers or things like that. So, so basically also on March 11th, we had an open house on both of the properties. It was lightly attended, but we did have some, some people come, come through the houses. Um, and then at this point, we have three offers to date. One offer has uh, made an offer on both properties, and then another offer has made a uh, offer on one of the properties. Uh, we have till tomorrow, tomorrow is the deadline. After that, 
after we get if we get more we'll compile those um, offers you know put a brief summary together on those offers and give them to the CRA board for their review and consideration on who you would like us to start negotiating contract with so that's kind of the update on that and so you know look forward to that coming up and thank you so much uh, before you go what do we need to do to put that third property that we pulled into a notice like um, I would probably say if you want to make a motion that we go ahead and um, do a notice to of intent to dispose, and I don't have the address with me, but for that third for that third property, and we can move through the motions pretty easily. You know, they have, I believe it's six nineteen or ten. I'm sorry, I just remember it's Sixth Street Court East. Right? Uh, Sixth Street. Sixth Street, Sixth Street East. Ten nineteen. Yeah. I don't remember it. Off the top of my head. So. Well, if well, we, 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 we please, know. you know, we should. <laughs> we know. I think if if we want we to just word it that it would was the former BPD substation, former substation adjacent to the Lincoln Village. That makes me a little more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Not that any government, not ours, <laughs> tore down property that they weren't supposed to. Not us. <laughs> oh, and I'm dead serious. It was not us, but it was somebody else. I remember. Because so, the notice was wrong. Former BPD substation on 6th Street East. And <laughs> to put that back up for sale. Motion to put that property back on for sale. Second. Motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Passes. Uh, ask a question, though. You may. It, are you doing any internet to, pro to promote it? Any s social media? Well, no, I just, I was, if, if it was only Brain and Herald yeah. and the open house, was there any other? There was uh, information on our website. Okay. Uh, we had um, also reached out to people that had been interested if properties came up for sale. Mm -hmm. So we had emailed them as well. I guess you can't really well, we do MLS it. or anything, can you? I don't have that capability. We don't have that. Well, we have agents that we've utilized in the past. I just, yeah. I just want to. That's so not a bad idea. Wider. Well, well they've, it's, it's only it's till tomorrow, but maybe for the next one. I don't know. And we did send it to the CCRA advisory board, too, so they can help us spread the word out. Okay. But we can definitely tr think of more ways if we can. I just know in the past we've used, but then, of course, you know, there's a cost associated once you mm -hmm. get, put an agent in it. I mean, I could put it on, but I think that's a conflict. That's mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I mean, I wouldn't take any commission. Well, no, I understand but just, that, but sometimes just no good deed into, goes unpunished. Uh, yeah, really. Um, I think you can, though, put a for sale by owner in the MLS that would get it out to the agents, but then they're going to want compensation. Well, Maybe just leave me alone. The, Never mind. For the next disregard, the next time we do this. All right. Uh, other discussion or new business? Anybody? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the only thing I was going to ask is, you know, there was a motion previously to schedule a special meeting. Does the board want to hash that out now? or? I think they're going to have to – are you talking about for the embracing our differences? Mm -hmm. I think they're going to have to find out what time they're going to need because it's got to go through BPD, fire. That process is usually – they can – yeah, they, they're having that meeting on the if, day. If they get that – all of that information turned in – yeah, they to be put on that agenda, it still takes time. Yeah. It's not something that they could do one day and we could do the next day. And it's too bad we didn't have that information today. Well, um, I mean, I'm I don't know why they didn't. Simmering quietly at the fact that we didn't have that. And that's something we absolutely need to have. It's, I mean, we had a lot of people down here talking in support of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for and us then not they to have that is that really information. I don't. disappointing. Yeah. I mean, it's not on them. Like, I mean, they guess they were kind of told they didn't have to, but. But there's due diligence that we need to make sure of situations like that. And it um, does. Well, and with this being the first time anybody's come forward to use that property or ask yeah. permission to use that property, and it has, it's not an, it's not an improved lot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's I, I just thought we, I thought the process would have been for city or CR. It shouldn't be that divided, or if so, then it should be a process for both, I guess. Mm. <laughs> but we're just new in this business anyway. <laughs> it is unique. I appreciate you all entertaining yeah, it. Yeah, that was... 
It's a it's, it's a great exhibit. Yeah. Yes. I yeah. have no problem with that. Well, we have me neither. It, it really was a matter of the yeah, you know the people the wanting the vote, yeah, the safety. village people, the village of the arts people, <laughs> the village people. <laughs> I am not doing well. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might be there too. You never know. <laughs> Go ahead. I just very very quickly to throw out that uh, one of the projects we're moving along is the demolition of the former substation in the 14th Street. In order to get that done, uh, we're doing an asbestos survey, um, <laughs> which will tell us what else we may need if we go out to an RFQ of the requirements for that. And we're waiting. We have a legal question out um, about the process, whether we need to RFQ it or not. And as soon as we get both of these items, then we'll move forward with proceeding and we'll update you at the next meeting. Yeah, let my doctor know about that asbestos rating. I'd like to know yeah. about that down the line. Probably. I'm sure it's going to be an interesting. <laughs> my office being there for about five years. Well, they uh, knew it. They well, knew there was asbestos. They didn't say that to me. As far as the next meeting, our next full meeting, um, there are a couple agreements we need to have. Just put it out there. We need to have on there. And that's um, Realize Bradenton and also um, who spoke to us first today. Uh, Keep Vanity Beautiful. Vanity Beautiful. Yeah. Those are ones that we are be done. Just They're scheduled for the next meeting, yes. All right. Any other business? No? Thank you. We're adjourned. God, you are.